video. Not yet. <laughs> Hope that part didn't go in the video. Then what? I didn't start it yet. I started it now. Are we recording now? Yes. yes. That's why we're telling you to turn it off. Turn off the game. Let's continue. Oh, oh but you can play Monster Hunter Ultimate without... So All right, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Bet you can't do two things at once and get your ass killed. Oh, you think so? Yes. Yeah, I'm do it. I ain't no bitch. I ain't no bitch. Anyway, um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with I'm what's going on right now, <laughs> um, Urban Ninja moved. Uh, we are in a completely different location, and um, setting up the uh, office is taking a while, so. Give me some time. I got you on that one. Yeah. So yeah. But anyway, for the time being, this is th- th- this is it. This, this is, is our new right spread. Now. For I need right the now. new spread for. But I don't know how this is gonna kind of work because. Well, my balls are already in pain. So yeah. let's continue. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, can we? Well, why are we just adjust it? Because his balls hurting now. Your balls is hurting. Yeah, because balls maybe because I'm what on the edge of this shit. Right now. This is ridiculous. Right. Anyway, what's going on, you? You? Motherfuckers. It's I guess boys. it's a soccer eye clan since we're on his channel. Yeah, obviously. But what's up, motherfuckers? It's your boy, the Urban Ninja himself, aka the Grandmaster. I'm not saying that long ass intro. Now you say something. He sucks. Nobody can hear you. Say it loud. Well, here's Master Zen, and I and, uh, here's your truly Master of Sack right here. Balls. In the court. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm having a um a good day. I had um some spicy candy. Let us continue. <laughs> what? Okay. I, All right. Um. I don't have, I don't have what was I about to say? Yeah. Okay. So this has been highly anticipated for us to react to. The moment it the moment it dropped, I was getting so many blown up notifications talking about oh my god, it's here. Donald Fear that the car just uploaded it. Donald Fear, it's here, it's here, it's here. Even when he had uh posted about it being delayed for a minute, they even let me know about that. I was like, dude, I know. I follow this dude on Twitter. I subscribed to him on YouTube. I'm gonna know. <laughs> so it's okay. It's alright. I, but but I, what I am surprised is that I said before it's very um, heartwarming to know that people still do like I actually give a damn about what we gotta say, even though it is Linkar's video. It is. It's still going to be Linkar's video. But y'all wanted us to react to it because you wanted to hear what we had to say and our viewpoint on it. Fuck, I got half a face. It's so weird. Yeah. That because because. We yeah, have it. We have it positioned it, like it's, this. It's okay. and everything it, again, the, the the setup will get a lot better going going forward. But yeah, I, I hope. So, without further ado, let's um get, get this situated. Let's get the ball rolling, suckers. Yeah. I'm yes. gonna cry, dog. In a memory, <sighs> oh no, he felt about that. You rangers are about to be D. U-N-E! Will be doom? Do you mean done? No, he said what he meant. For he is the Kwisatz Haderach! Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Dino Fury. I didn't get this one. Oh, that's nice! Yeah, that's hot. Nice. Beast Morphers was pretty damn good. It mined a lot of Power Rangers lore, both older and newer, to show that continuity is not necessarily a hindrance to telling a good story, even if parts of it echo what has happened before. After Beast Morphers, Simon Bennett, who had been a frequent director on both Ninja Steel and Beast Morphers, became the official showrunner. And wow, you never really realize how nice it is to have someone actually talk about behind the scenes of the show and the difficulties of making it until you actually have someone doing it. Bennett has been quite open about the production of the show, the difficulties he faced working under other seasons, and done a healthy amount of promotion, even pointing out that with Dino Fury, they're more acknowledging the adult fan base. Now that part I'll get into more in another video, but for now, some behind the scenes on past seasons is interesting. 
It's amazing hearing about some of the mandates they had, not just for Ninja Steel, but for Beast Morphers. Since while Beast Morphers actually felt like the reins were loose, apparently Saban still had some creative input, and thus mandates and restrictions were put on the series. For Ninja Steel, while the show had a ninja theme, the show was not allowed to do any ninja stuff other than being stealthy. I mean, sure, you kind of expect that a children's show wouldn't have assassinations or anything, but it's still odd that other stuff was off the table. They were required to have two standalone Victor and Mon scenes in each episode due to how the show was filmed. More on that later. Episodes had to have a moral of the week and ADR during fights had to be filled with puns. There was apparently a Saban executive who loved, loved the fart so jokes, fun. insisted on them. His exact words were, they insisted on auditioning catalogs of fart sounds to select individual sound effects that were to be used in the show. I used this image a lot in my... Wait, wasn't that wasn't that an um which 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 Power Rangers was that anyway? They, they did that a lot too. Wasn't it just there? Was it was another one that did that in two? No, or oh, was just this one? It was just this one. Yep, that explains so much. And what I also want to say, and while I'm I, I don't mean to be off camera, is that <clears throat> this was around the time when Ninja Steel was still on Nickelodeon, uh, from what I understand. Yep. That was that that's the channel that that you know. Accepted all that. But here's the thing about this, though. Um, executives of Saban. Um, well, There's only one executive. Well, one executive. Who liked fart jokes. Um, that is so... so that boring. era of comedy is over. Especially for Nickelodeon. That era of comedy is done. Since that whole thing what went on with the director of iCarly. I forget what his name is. His, he, he was Man, in a lot of... Uh, I forget his name too. But he, he was in a lot, lot of the projects for, yeah. for a lot of Nickelodeon uh, shows. Since that dude went on the fire and, and got completely banned from that IP like oh, in its entirety. Uh, 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 Dan something. Yeah. Yeah, him. Dan Schneider. Yeah, yeah Dan Schneider. Because he he was he was a big fan of, of, that, of that kind of stuff. And, and but it, but it was always very weird. It was very it, it was, was very off the net, all putting in sus. Yeah, 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 he he was in defeat a lot. Yeah, and, was, and that, that's where that whole feet like all the feet jokes came from for all those shows. Mm -hmm. And it's just like bodily functions and 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 making jokes about like uh, body parts. This is it's it's, it's 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 outdated it's childish it, it's it really is child now, 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 even kids not are not even into like into that kind of stuff they a fortnite if anything in reverse they're into more ninja stuff they're into more i could say more fortnite like fortnite stuff they're well, into well maybe not ninjas directly but more stuff aligned with cool yeah like fart uh, the, jokes like like that, you know what i'm saying like that, that's a part of our era growing up in middle school yeah that that, shit that, the, that was that was like the the 80s and 90s era but those days are over now even even kind of 2000s but like like well early far, 2000s like not that far anymore. not that far but still but i, I could have sworn there was another series that did like that but shit, it, it, it might have been but for the for the life of me this is currently this is the only power rangers thing that where, where they they had to do that? Yeah, yeah, For whatever well. reason, that sounds dumb as hell. Man. <sighs> Twitter watch thread of Dino Fury, but I think it really applies here. Serialization threads were not allowed or heavily discouraged, save for first and last episodes. Evil Rangers were not permitted, save for mind control, which is especially weird when they've had Evil Rangers before, plus Beast Morphers had what could be considered Evil Rangers, even if their outfits were a bit more outlandish. Terminator, Blaze, and Roxy were destroyed all the time in Season 2 because episodes had to be self-contained which is just head-scratching, because then why isn't Scrozzle destroyed in every episode? And the bad guys had to be blown up. Continuity between seasons was also loosely banned, fearing that the young kids in the audience wouldn't retain information. It does make a little sense, except anecdotal. Wouldn't retain information? Wouldn't retain information. Okay, so, so they, they, they literally think it's dumb. They literally think they're dumb, that they're not going to remember nothing. Oh, they don't, aren't going to pay attention. Yeah, they already indoctrinated. What else, what else could you call them? I don't, I don't know. As a kid, it was the serialized stuff that kept me watching. Yeah. Obviously not the same for everyone, but I was in Power Rangers' target demographic in 1993, and multi-parters and ongoing story threads kept making me want to see more. Hell Apparently, yeah. RPM was seen as a failure because it was too adult, 
And certainly not because it was poorly advertised and placed in a terrible time slot. What goes through the heads of some executives, I wonder? You'd think with access to so much information about kids, what they watch and how they play and what sort of shows they gravitate towards, that they'd understand this stuff better and not have that kind of mindset. But no, with they theory, don't. Saban was officially out of any consulting on the show. Still, mandates existed and there was some meddling. The big one being that Dino Fury was not intended to be 44 episodes like last few seasons had been, but only 22. Apparently it was fairly simple to stretch out the arcs they had planned for the story, spread them out across two seasons worth of episodes, and I applaud that, especially with something in particular that they added in we'll get to. For now though, let's see what they did with Power Rangers without Saban's leash. We begin the season with Destination Dino Henge, and if in response to my complaining last time about the theme song being put halfway through the episode, we have the theme song right at the start. And it's not great. At least with the one in Beast Morphers, the occasional techno -y music and digitized speech work with a technologically focused show. But this one's about dinosaurs. A lot of it is just repeating Go Go Power Rangers over and over like the Beast Morphers theme, yeah. save yeah. for one spot where the singer speaks. It's probably the most like unique part of the though. song, and I don't even think it's that good. Honestly, if the themes didn't say their season names in them, I'd probably have a hard time distinguishing between Beast Morphers and Dino Fury's themes. We open in the city of Pine Ridge. Okay, okay. It's not that bad. That, oh, oh, that's, that's not terrible. Now, so, but... now see, here's, here's what I'm going to say about this. Here's, here's what I'm going to say. I didn't have a problem with that. Yeah, that's not that, that bad. That part, I didn't have a problem with that. What I did have a problem with, what I still do have a problem with, is that... Be good. Like I said before, with um um <laughs> the Mega Force, Super Mega Force, we now have content creators who are literally going out of their way making better theme music Much better. for Power Rangers than the official brand. Official. And it's very sad because when this when Donald Fury got announced, everybody was literally flipping their lids because why not? Di like knights, the word knights was literally there, but instead of choosing knights, fury. Why? It's literally about knights. Why you so you could you you tell me you could not just call it Dino Knights? You couldn't just call it that. Personally, I prefer Dino Fury, but I see what you're saying now. No, it's not a bad idea. You want to know why I say Dino Knights? Because there was a song that was, I'm going to put in this video. Isn't it the one I showed you? Yes, and it's and I still listen to it to this very Dairy Masters and I thank you for that. It is absolute fire. That song, is, it's fucking fire. Fucking amazing. Dino Knights, they will win the fight with their Dino Bunny. Calling on the ancient power of the Dino Soul. Burning to control. So, again, another L with the with the, the theme song. And there's another reason why I didn't I didn't watch this. Uh, but also, I will say this in advance: I didn't watch Real Soldier, even though I liked the theme for Real Soldier. I didn't really watch Real Soldier all the way. I watched, I watched Real Soldier. That was fun. I watched, I watched bits and pieces of it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really get. I didn't get back into Sentai until uh, Dawn Brothers, actually, which is my mistake. Cause the Sentai is a lot better. But um, I did see like the first couple episodes of Dino Fury, and wasn't that impressed. I was just like, okay, typical cringe, teenage crap, and crazy one-liners that don't make sense. But that's all the TV these days, anyway. So. I don't understand why we're not, why it's it's so bad to move towards a little bit adult in front of Power Rangers. That your audience grew up, y'all. The people who enjoy Power Rangers the most, the ones that buy your stuff. But even but it's it, us. But even still, like it's on Nickelodeon, so Nickelodeon is still technically a kids network. But didn't they leave Nickelodeon though? No. Whoa. Well, no. Well, I know Dino Fury is on Netflix. But, I think, yeah, so Down of Fear, I think, is the first one that started premiering. No, 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 I'm lying. It was Beast Morphers. That was on uh, Netflix first. That's how I watched it. Thank you, Netflix. Um, 
I think they shied away from it after Ninja Steel, actually, right? Yes. Yeah. Shy, I think they shied away from it around there. So that's why I guess they wanted to wanted to be adult rated, mm-hmm. which is fine and dandy, but fart jokes not adult rated. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I mean, my my thing is, and I know it's not gonna happen. You have the 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 budget. Yeah, the budget maybe. and the information. It's not hard to keep. Let's say Pokemon. I love Charizard. Nah, I love. No, 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 hang on. Nah. I love Charizard. I love Pikachu. I don't need them shoved in every modern game. Move away from this stuff. Go forward, not backwards. The nostalgia is cool. But after a while, it's like, okay, we, we get it. I got it. Right. Cool. Move the fuck on from that. Move the fuck on. But there for some are, reason. There are two, well, maybe one or two. There are other content creators, like, like Rio said. That make better themes. Give them a call. Shoot them an email. We want you to do the theme for the show. We'll pay you an X amount of money. And you can make residual royalty because the show's going to premiere here. Blah, blah, freaking blah. TLDR. You got to do better, Saban. Jesus Christ. No, but didn't they say Saban? No. They said, um, yeah, they said Saban that they don't have that much rain on this. But, I, but here's the thing, though. Despite that fact, they still got a they, they, they still got some right to say. They do, and that's and that's but actually, that's what's it, eating at but me. But didn't Hasbro buy out Sabon? They was did, it? but here's the problem: the exact one of the executives is is buzzing in their fucking ears, saying that oh, y'all should do this, oh y'all should do that. It shouldn't be like this. It should be like that. If that is the truth, and they don't have that, they shouldn't have any. It shouldn't be anywhere near the the project handling, the story right. wise, all of that. Why are they having? Why 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 is their words so much more effective? Just, just like Lynn Carr said, who what what is what's going through their mind? What's going through their heads? Who knows? Probably some crazy kid loving crap. But that's a, that's. But that's the thing though, and that's another <laughs> thing I wanted to say because we had this conversation right a few months ago. Why are why do they think they know kids? And they doing stuff that kids don't like. They think we're still kids. So when they think all the fart noises and all the tickling feet and crap is still funny and it's not. But how can you have a ninja show and no. be less ninja? Right. You don't gotta kill people. Ninja Storm didn't kill people. They killed monsters. They killed monsters. But they did they were more ninja than that and anything. Right. Actually, to tell you the truth, well, yeah, because Ninja Storm, they had their own dojo, everything. They they went on missions. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So, what's the, what's the problem? You could have done the same What was the point? Thing. Yeah, well, exactly. But then, but then, of course, you know, they, they, they borrow some of the footage from the Sentai, so they really can't, you know. It's yeah. A, and it's, a, it's a whole conundrum. This is crazy. <laughs> Meet this woman, Amelia, and we can see by the stickers on her moped that she's a big fan of the History Channel. She works at Buzz Blast, a news and pop culture review site, and has been having a hard time convincing her boss, Jane, to do a story on a supposedly haunted area of the nearby forest called Dino Henge. Apparently, in between video reviews of neon <laughs> lipstick that probably gives you cancer, she's been trying to write up stories about the supernatural for some time now. Jane's reluctant, but since Amelia actually does get her work out on time, she's willing to give this one a shot. But I want a factual story about a local landmark. Nothing paranormal. Watch as it turns out she was a student of Mr. Burley from Megaforce, and she uses him as her primary source. She heads out with her, well, I was going to say primitive Ghostbuster equipment, but honestly, given how sleek that thing looks, it almost seems like it probably is more advanced than that. Still, the device she has can supposedly detect and capture ghosts. Oh, a ghost. Finally. And that's when she's attacked by Xenomorphs. She launches an electrified net at the supposed ghost, but it's just a bicyclist yep. wearing a raincoat on this perfectly clear day. She asks the guy, Ollie, what he's doing out there. Online reviews said it was a great place to get set. As someone who's been doing reviews for 15 years, it's always incredible to see how online reviews have changed over all this time. These days, you could have a three-hour video on getting zapped by nets, and no one would be shocked. Except for the people being zapped by nets. Ali is trying to get to a meeting with his mother in Dino Henge and has lost his way. But fortunately, Amelia has... Uh... A map. A physical map. 
a folded up physical map. Is it weird that it isn't her cryptozoology hobby that ruined my suspension of belief, but her using a physical map does? They reach the Henge, a series of dinosaur statues coming out of the ground. Ollie's mother is there, an archaeologist studying the statues. Theoretically, they're millions of years old, but no one is sure who put them there and why. She launches a drone to try to scan for structures under the statues, but the scan just makes the eyes of the statues glow and the area shakes. When things settle, they do find a chamber underground. Before they can investigate further, Park Warden Garcia shows up and points out that none of them have a permit to be there and orders them to leave and come back with him to file a report on this. As they pack up the equipment, Ollie learns that Amelia was chasing ghosts and balks at the idea of them existing, the two clearly frustrated by the other's beliefs. However, it seems the Henge is popular today as a purple figure teleports in. He blasts a hole in the ground. Ollie's mother and the warden have walked off at this point, though should still be close enough to hear the blast. The two follow him down and discover a high-tech base. The purple figure finds some kind of lizard woman and blasts her. Firstly, I'm a dinosaur, not a lizard. I mean, she's right, but it feels like semantics aren't important right now. The purple figure introduces himself as Void Knight and says she can't fight his power, but then she unveils a Red Ranger. Boy Knight specifically calling it a Power Ranger. However, the Red Ranger doesn't emerge from the chamber it was in, and Void Knight presses the attack. Ollie grabs a nearby sword and defends her, Amelia following through with the electrified net. The dinosaur woman tries to give them a key to activate the Hengemen to fight him. Oh, hey, neat wordplay. But yeah, Void Knight intercepts the key and activates them himself, revealing our foot soldiers. I've done three years of karate. Yeah, me too. Okay, but have you ever locked arms and legs with two other people and spun them around in a circle? Because that's real martial arts right there. With a bit of more realism, it's not like they're doing a bunch of fancy... <laughs> On God and my mama. Well, before we die, we doing that shit. Oh my God. <laughs> Who's swinging who? All right, you do... You, do you, be, Jason, the you, do you be the base. You be the base. I'm going to be the black man on your show. <laughs> And, I, and I'm a lock. I'm a lock on my legs. And his me. legs. So I'm gonna lean back. And <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I don't think he can be the base because his knees. Oh yeah, true. We don't want to fall. Dang. Oh well, that's that shast that I. I bet he did. Karate moves or anything with this. Learning karate in a safe gym environment isn't really the same thing as fighting for your life against robots armed with pikes. However, the swords the two have start glowing. The swords form morphers for them, and the dinosaur lady gives them keys to activate them. The two morph and fight off the henchmen, Ollie mentioning that if you've watched the news before, they get zords too. Which, just to spoil this now, we're back in the prime universe. Though that does make the disbelief in the supernatural yeah, kind of head tilting. Void Knight finally finds the energy source he's been looking for, the Sporix. He takes the chest of them, Why'd but the dinosaur woman is finally able to wake up the Red oh, Ranger, uh. Zato. Zato recognizes the armor Void Knight is wearing, knowing it's stolen. The Sporix end up released, and they fly out of the chamber, Void Knight fleeing as well. He collects collapses the tunnel behind him to keep them from pursuing. The Sporex fly into the air, but one drops down and forms into a monster, whom he recruits to retrieve the rest. Back in the Command Henge, our heroes demorph and Zeta was revealed to be a telepathic alien. And instead of being entirely human looking like Andros, he's got antennae like Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy. He also introduces the dinosaur woman as Solon. She reveals to him that he's been in stasis for 65 million years. Zeta explains via telepathic flashback that his planet, Rafcon, was invaded by the Sporex. Leading the Knights of Rafcon against the Sporex, which, as we saw, hatched into monsters, he defended his world as best as he could against them, but ultimately failed. The planet was devastated, and the Sporex left for their next conquest, Earth. He and the Knights followed them, oh, yeah. fighting alongside dinosaurs to defend the planet, until the Sporex learned to grow giant-sized. Before they could be wiped out, though, they were saved by ancient beings called the Morphin Masters. Okay, uh, this requires some deep lore diving. Like, the kind of reference that only makes sense if you're an obsessed weirdo like me, or, thanks to the internet, have access to fan wikis. Way back in the original first season of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Episode 7, Big Sisters, which consequently was the episode that introduced the Radbug, Zordon mentioned a group of sorcerers known as the Morphin Masters that imbued a bunch of power into power eggs to be protected from the forces of evil. The chest containing the eggs could only be unlocked by the touch oh, of an innocent yeah. child because wizards 
wizards are goofy like that. They were just a bit of lore fill, just an excuse to use some Sentai footage, nothing else about them ever mentioned again, until the Boom Studios comics decided to pick up on that and greatly expand the lore on them. Oh. And I guess they decided to feed it back into the TV series. It's just such a weird thing to bring back, a reference No, it ain't, it ain't weird. I love it. Oh. I love it. And you know what? I'll, I am so happy. Thank uh, you, Boom Studios, for doing that. I, I appreciate I'll, it. I was like, what the f Now that now it makes sense. Now, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm going to say this, too. You're going to say it. This is a stretch. It's a stretch. Now that we have established this world that... what, what What's his name? Um, what's he, What he called himself? Raycon? Void Knight? No, oh. the alien, Red the Ranger. The alien, the Red Ranger. Oh, it's, 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 we'll call him Ray for now. Yeah, uh, well, well, yeah what? Yeah, Brian's Raycon. Yeah, uh, uh, Raycon. Um, we'll now that we have established his planet, and it's literally consists of a mid the medieval time mixed mid with dinosaurs. Dumb, but whatever. Can we do something about Mystic Knights? Nah. Uh, no, because his planet was destroyed and it came to Earth. But can we just touch base up on it just a little bit? Call Boom Studios, they'll handle because it. Because I feel some type of way. Uh, because sure look, feel that way. if you, if you, <laughs> if you <laughs> gonna bring back knights, why not, why not reintroduce the Mystic Knights? Because they went nowhere. Mm -hmm. that, 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 was a, that was a show that you could rarely catch. Cause it came on after we got home from school, yeah. or Mitch? yeah, or at the end of of the whole program of Fox Kids, like like at the very end, they show the Mystic Knights. Mystic. I'm just like, yo, why not? Why why would y'all do this? And the crazy thing about it is, people love Mystic Knights. Oh, these oh yeah, those peoples. Damn, why like, have I never seen this? I seen it once. You've before. never and seen I it. I actually had the action figure. I had like probably seen five or so minutes of it. I I never caught it coming home from school. Well, what time? What time did you get home from school back in the day? I got home from school around like three thirty, um, and around the time I was probably watching Arthur or something around that time. Yeah, and that's know. another thing. A, a lot of us was well, watching Cyber Arthur, Chase, uh, like Cyber Yoko Chase, PBS Kids, yeah. Cole Lyoko. Yeah. But around the time, like I want to say three thirty, four o'clock, that that show would come on. Huh? Yeah. Now, I know I've seen it, but I never, like, watched it. Of course you never watched it. You shut your face. Anyway. Continue. Nowhere do a teensy, tiny bit of otherwise forgotten lore. It'd be like if they referenced Lokar, the giant head wizard thing that Rita called for help twice, and was, like the Morphin Masters, so inconsequential I never mentioned them in the original Season 1 video. The Masters had come to help, imbuing the six remaining knights with the power of the dinosaurs freezing the animals in statues while granting the knights their power. And for whatever reason, the season is not called Dino Knights or Dino Swords or Dino Masters or a thousand other better names than Dino Fury. Apparently Dino Knights was the working title for the series as it was being developed, but Hasbro had the final say and made it Dino Fury. And yet that's what the Morphin Masters called them, additionally giving them Zords to fight the giant Sporex. While the Rangers were successful in stopping them, the other five knights were killed in the battle. Zato and Solon were able to recapture the Sporex, but they're basically indestructible. The best they could hope for was to contain and hide them. The Sporex that are loose will hibernate until they're ready to hatch, so our heroes need to train and ready themselves for their eventual attacks. This is an okay season opener, starting us slowly with only a few characters, but the writing and acting feel a bit weaker than others. Obviously, mixed acting is just something you expect when the season is just starting out, but a lot of line delivery just feels flat for some reason. The dialogue just doesn't have anything too funny or memorable is all. And when Zato reads their minds for the first time, Zato. it feels very much like an informed attributes kind of moment when he lists off their personalities. Sure, we'd already seen their personalities demonstrated before this, but I don't know. Something just seemed off about this compared to other season openers. Might also just be that something about Zato's antennae really seeing weird and off-putting. Like it might be a man of black. Thing for these little flesh-colored tubes sitting on his head. I don't know why they bother me when other shows and movies have done the same effect, but 
There's something about them that's just yeesh here. Sure, it's phallic. Why wouldn't it be? Anyway, we continue in Sporex Unleashed. Amusingly, it begins with the three practicing their morphing poses and calling out the phrase. Just to get it out of the way, I'm not too fond of the morphers. They're basically just a rehash of the Dino Thunder morphers, but with a larger back and the addition of a key. I do like how they spin the key after inserting it. It's just the design of the morpher itself feels a bit underwhelming. Something else I have a minor issue with is the outfit. Not a huge problem. I like the overall design and the night helmet visors, though admittedly it seems like those would impede vision a bit. But what bugs me is the gray half of the outfits that makes the costume asymmetrical and consequently busier. Sure, gray is already part of the outfit by way of the helmets and gloves, but I think it would have looked better as just one color all around. Anyway, speaking of that key, Ollie and Amelia point out that there should be powers for six rangers and wonder if they can recruit people. But Zato says that the other three keys were lost along with the original rangers. They can also explicitly teleport with honestly the best teleportation effects we've had in the franchise in my humble opinion. Megaforce's wispy teleport effect was neat, but then they forgot they could do it afterwards. This one actually looks like they're being beamed away. Solon's gotten the base defense systems up again so only they can enter and she's found a scanning device that Void Knight had been using. We saw him drop it in the first episode. Ollie thinks he can combine it with his mom's drone to scan for all the Sporex, but Zato and Amelia say their priority should be to warn the town. They bring Zato to the city and of course he's amazed by how much has changed in 65 million years. Where are the dinosaurs? I'd love to see some. Well, in another dimension, you can find them in a zoo, but I wouldn't recommend going there unless you want the space-time continuum to be repeatedly smashed in the face with a rock. Zeno can also retract his antennae to appear more human. They head to the Park Service HQ. But remember, no one can know that you're rangers. Why? Sure, we know all the logical reasons for a secret identity, but why does Zato care? Humans didn't even exist 65 million years ago, and I doubt they were keeping it secret from the T-Rexes lest they invade their privacy on dinosaur social media. Anyway, without that evidence of them morphing or something, naturally, Warden Garcia thinks they're full of it. Still, Ollie's mom believes him, and he shows her the scanner and tells her his idea. Then we see them try to convince Jane to get the word out about the Sporex, but first we get our hinting of this taking place in the Prime Universe, as she unveils that she's getting a robot assistant to take over for her in the future. And it's manufactured by Hartford Robotics. I do wonder how Mac feels about mass-produced robot servants for people given his origins, though maybe they aren't programmed for sentience like he was. But yeah, after wowing everyone with J-Borg, as she's called, they're interrupted by Good video job. footage of a Sporex beast forming, and our heroes go to deal with it. Void Knight and his minion return to Dino Henge to try to retrieve the scanner, but find it protected by a force field. They observe Ollie's mom working on mounting the scanner to the drone. Our heroes intercept the Sporex beast, and we get our first proper morphing sequence, and I actually quite like it. It's got a lot of cool visual elements. The Rangers kind of floating in the air as the suit forms around them, what appear to be constellations around them. But of course, what would dinosaur rangers have to do with cosmic stuff, am I right? Honestly, the only part that doesn't quite work is their exclamations of what dinosaur ranger they are. The acting just feels more subdued than it should be. They try to add an echo effect, but it's barely audible when it doesn't seem like they're shouting it. Additional booster keys can be used by the rangers to provide new armor and enhancements, as demonstrated with a stink bomb attack with flatulence noises added in. Uh, yeah, I know this is Sentai's footage fault, but still... Thanks, Dino Fury. Beast Morphers have made me forget that little addition of the last few years. Anyway, the monster that was serving as Void Knight's minion, Shockhorn, arrives and summons henchmen to fight the Rangers. Not sure how they do so, though. Yeah, Void Knight took control of the ones in the command center, but that was like a dozen at most and several got destroyed. How is he making more to summon up for fights? Anyway, the Sporex Beast is recruited to joining Void Knight, since apparently these things love taking orders. Her words, not mine. After they leave, our heroes learn that the video of the Sporex is getting around and thus people are being informed of it. Ollie tells the others what he did with the scanner, but Zato points out Void Knight might return and look for it. And indeed, they find her being attacked by the monsters. After the rangers distract them, she sends the drone crashing down into Shockhorn, and I guess the drone was loaded with explosives for some reason because it becomes a friggin' bomb. Shockhorn grows giant-sized and Zato heads out in the T-Rex champion Zord to take him on. The thing is a battle mode, and credit to the original Zord footage from Ryu Soldier. Sorry about the pronunciation. Not sure if it's just filmed with a high-speed camera or if the suit was designed for more agile movement, but it looks like it can actually move pretty quickly despite the standard bulky suit action. Anyway, they blow it up, but destroying a Sporex Beast doesn't actually kill it. It just reverts to the fungal form and with increased power. Void Knight yeah. manages to grab it before the... Okay, but I, I was sitting there thinking that after they would, you know, get giant or whatever, 
It probably just fused into like stuff at the end. No, but the stage beginning they're invincible. So once yeah. they defeat it, either they get big. Then once their big form get defeated, they go back to that small little wiggly form that you got 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 creeped out about. So then, how the freak do you dis- how how do how do you deal with it then? What they were doing, imprisoning it. That it that doesn't work because the, that purple motherfucker went and woke him up. Oh yeah. 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 It gave me, it gave me the heebie jeez. It, 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 it looked like some pulse, some pulsating uh, uh, pus. Like it's just ugh, <laughs> ugh. Oh uh, yeah, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Ryu Sakurai have problems with pulsating pulse, pulse. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we gonna scroll up ahead. Rangers cam. The Rangers put out an official PSA up, warning really? people about the Sporex, even setting up a hotline oh, and direct so. messaging service to contact them if I someone finds hair. one of them. I want to see her hair. I wanted to see her hair. I didn't know what she was not talking about. The Red Ranger? I don't know. <laughs> hey, girl, what's, what's, what's up with that suit? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Clearly, we high right now. No, we're not. Well, well, by the was. way, was real. The production team set it up, and they would answer with pre-recorded messages from the Rangers. Obviously, it's defunct now. Meanwhile, Void Knight and the other Sporex Beast, Mucus, set up shop at this vault-looking place. Pretty sure this is where Bunny Smiles Incorporated keeps their old animatronics. Actually, hey, Void Knight refers to it as Area 62, an old government installation now long abandoned. He uses the Sporex he retrieved in a machine to power it up saying he needs a lot more before it's ready. At the beginning of episode three, Lost Signal, we get some pathos for Zato as he recalls his mother giving him a gem when he became a knight and oh, in turn oh, talking to Amelia about how much well, she misses Rafcon. Few people survived, but thousands of millions of years ago. The Triceroblade and Ankylo Hammer Zord are unleashed to help fight the monster of the week, and we can see that, like, all the Zords have a robotic ranger also as part of them. Weird. Anyway, they all form up into the Dino Fury Megazord and destroy the monster. As part of the episode, they also received a strange signal from space that could have come from Rathcon, but the language is indecipherable. Still, they can also transmit a message, so Zato sends out a signal in the hope that someone on Rathcon is there to hear it. This brings us to episode 4, New Recruits. Voidnet assembles a new robot general, Boom Tower, while the Rangers try to get Zato a job as a reporter at Buzzbum or wherever for... Reasons that completely elude me. I mean, yeah, sure, he should probably have a life outside of being a ranger, but he's not interested in journalism or pop culture or makeup or the various other things that Buzz Bomber does videos for, so why this? Hell, he lives at the Command Henge. He doesn't have rent or anything to worry about, and he also doesn't have any documentation he'd probably need for a job like this. In any case, his rival for the job is Javi Garcia, a musician who also wants the job so he can raise money for a guitar. The Rangers look at him as if he's insane. Our heroes suck because Keytars are awesome. The two are given competing assignments to see who does a better job at it, meaning she gets free work out of one of them if both articles are good. This is why unions are so important, kids. Anyway, Javi is assigned to do a story on a mystical rock at the museum that Void Knight wants to steal for Boom Tower, while Zato has to interview Izzy Garcia, the top teen athlete at Pine Ridge High. She agrees to the interview when he offers a tip about her javelin throwing, which is as simple as aim slightly higher to get more distance, and that seems like the kind of thing she'd know already being the top athlete, but whatever, she tries it. <laughs> we also learned that Izzy is Warden Garcia's stepdaughter. At the museum, the Sporex attack and Javi calls into the Ranger hotline to report it. Warden Garcia himself actually shows up to try to stop them, it goes about as well as you'd expect. Boom Tower has the mystical orb. With the orb, I'll be invincible. Invincible? That's not good. Javi manages to get away with the orb. Later, we learn that today is Massive Coincidence Day, as the Warden admits that Javi is his son, and they'll try to track him down as soon as possible. I mean, it was pretty obvious when all three have the same last name, but still. After her father walks away, Izzy tells the Rangers that her brother goes to a secret spot to practice his music, since their father doesn't approve. The Sporex intercept Javi, but fortunately our heroes arrive to save him. To keep oh, the monsters from sister. getting the okay. orb, Javi smashes it on some rocks, uh, an revealing the green and black green dino black keys. Ranger and thus the siblings also. have become the black and green rangers. Brothers, they're brothers. Oh, they're brothers. oh okay. at least they... Skirts? Aren't really like that. Cute, but does she have to do that every time she morphs now? Anyway, fight scene. Javi, catch! <laughs> 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 
The henchmen are summoned, and I'm a bit late to say it, but I like their design. Reminiscent of medieval pikemen. The outfit is a little busy with the checkerboard patterns on their side, belt, and shield, along with the more elaborate designs on their helmets and chest piece, but otherwise, I like them. Anyway, they force Boom Tower to retreat and destroy another Sporex monster in yet another pretty damn good Megazord fight. Formal introductions are made, and Javi ends up getting the job at Buzz Bale because of his bravery in getting the orb. Next episode, Winning Attitude, they locate the Green Tiger Claws Ord, naturally in the spirit of the original Mighty Morphin days, we're including a saber-toothed tiger along with dinosaurs for some reason. Javi's Stego Spike Zord is found two episodes later in Stego Search. Meanwhile, Void Knight has a secret room at Area 62 that he refuses to let his minions enter even booby-trapping it with an electric field to shock anyone who tries to open it. More importantly, though, we have the next episode, Unexpected Guest. After a Sporex Beast manages to destabilize the Megazord, our heroes try to figure out a way to repair it, when, indeed, someone unexpected shows up. That's different. Mama! Holy crap, Mick! This is only the eighth episode, yet we're getting a legacy character to guest star. And hey, considering Ninja Steel was kind of snubbed last season, it's nice to... Wait, why was he a bird? I mean, yeah, he could shape shift the Ninja Steel, but he did so infrequently that I forgot it was a thing. Why didn't he just show up in a car or something? Why the bird poking at Zato? In any case, he's been chasing the Nexus Prism, also mentioning it has a strong direct connection to the Morphin Grid, across the galaxy and its return to Earth, landing somewhere in the area. Zato unexpectedly is a dick to him, saying they don't know him and have bigger problems to deal with, and thus doesn't care about the Nexus. Nick says he'll stay out of their hair, but Mucus, observing this, reports this news to Void Knight. Nick ends up at Buzzball to search Earth's databases for signs of the Prism, but that just makes me wonder why he hasn't kind contacted the Ninja Steel Rangers, or, like, any of the other Rangers on Earth. Speaking of, the Sporex tries to capture him to find the Prism, but our heroes bring him back to the Command Henge. He provides them with a database on all known Ranger teams, as well as giving some more exposition about the Nexus, how it has a mind of its own, and that no one really knows where it originally came from. Using their sensors, they quickly locate it near the waterfront. Since the Nexus is alive, Zato tries to use his telepathy to communicate with it. He sees a vision of the Morphin Masters creating various mystical objects to hand to Power Ranger teams, including the Dino Gem from Dino Thunder, the Air Gems, and the Nexus Prism itself. They sent it to Earth to fight evil, where it eventually ended up with the Ninja Steel Rangers. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. So they had... That's where... It, okay, okay, so uh, the whole... Uh, uh, no one knows where it came from. The Morphin Masters made the shit. There you go. There you go. And you know what's crazy? I want to. I wa also want to thank the people in the comments because y'all were letting me know that there's a lot of lore and and a lot of explanations as to why everything was just all kerbobbled and with well, why was this here? Why was that? It's because the Morphin Masters has been has been creating stuff behind the scenes and shipping it off to Earth the entire time. Well, we we all know who isn't making things for Power Rangers, Trey or Trifecta. I bring that motherfucker into this conversation. Yeah, you're right. No, Let's you continue. Know, you, know, you know what we should bring in? No. Nah. Doggy Kruger, because he definitely ain't making Let's shit. continue. <laughs> The Morphing Masters have been observing Ranger teams, including both the Beast Morphers and Dino Fury teams most recently. The Nexus has been sent out again to find something, but Zato isn't able to identify what, only that it's still searching. It heads into the water as the villains show up to try to claim it. What the In the hell? fight that follows, Boom Tower is destroyed, but the Nexus flies off for parts unknown. The Ranger's still not sure why it was here. We finally get to see what's inside of the secret chamber that Void Knight has. A woman suspended in fluid with wires hooked up to her. But I promise it What is it? Who is it? Whatever the cost, what? we'll be together again soon. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> I'd kill for that. Zato apologizes to Mick for being a douche, but it's all water under the We're bridge. Especially as Mick has to head out into space in pursuit of the Nexus. Obviously, it's not really a team-up episode, but as I said, it was nice to have some continuation yeah. of Ninja Steel, considering Beast Morphers' team-up was instead to Dino Charge. Ninja Steel wasn't hmm. a great season, but still part of the legacy, and it deserves some follow-up. Nice to have some resolution on the Nexus and its origins, given for it was real? so vague in the original season. In the 10th episode, Phoning Home, Void Knight and Mucus construct a new general and empower with a Sporex, this new enemy calling itself Slyther. 
Slyther has the ability to cast illusions and deceptions. Plus, he comes with an over-the-top magician voice, and I kind of love that. In the episode McScary Manor, Amelia's grandfather, referred to as Pop-Pop and had appeared already once before, reveals that he worked at Area 62 and that whatever they did there was top secret. Inside of the manor, Amelia locates the Blazing Dino Key, providing both another power-up armor to use on the ground while summoning up the Dimetro Blazing Zord. It can merge with the T-Rex Zord to form another Megazord. At the end of The Matchmaker, we have two big revelations. The first is Void Knight taking off his helmet. Not anybody we've met before, but it does seem to identify him as human, or at least a humanoid alien. The bigger, more important reveal, though, is that Izzy is a lesbian dating a minor character named Fern who had appeared a couple of times before this. Aside from Trini in the 2017 reboot movie, this is the first real acknowledgement of LGBT plus people in Power Rangers in 28 years, and the first time on TV. Wait, 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 Trini was lesbian? Yes. I mean, keep in mind, she did look at boys from time to time in that show. But, but I figured that was because that was our part. Fuck. I'm always just fucking scared. Progressive, or at least positive messages for kids, that's a bit of a lacking gap when other shows have been more willing to take that plunge years before this one. And making that first time one of the main characters, not just a one-off character of the week teaching a moral message about how prejudice is bad, is a good way to make up for lost time. Hell, making their partner someone we've seen before in previous episodes, and will be seen again, and having her friends and family being happy and treating it as something normal is so important for kids. Especially when we still have massive legal pushbacks against LGBT plus people in the real world. Now, full disclosure, I'm a white cisgender straight dude, so I'm not necessarily the most qualified to say it and take my opinions with a grain of salt, but I think this is great. Much yeah, better than great taking too. this franchise, and I have to give major props great. to the production for finally making it happen. For real! And again, during a time when hard-fought rights for LGBT plus Plus, people in America have been put in danger. Huh? No, really? and plus, and plus, not to mention, in Real Soldier, I didn't like the fact that it was only one girl. They did. Uh, well, part of that whole it's usually almost. Well, not usually almost. Always. Well, what was wrong with it? Now? <clears throat> one girl. Put some more girls in there. Get some more girls to be a part of the team, fam. I mean, like, I, I, like, I, I, I don't, I don't, I never thought it was fair to have one girl. And four guys to be a part of a team. No, she did the most anyway. She did do the most, but I'm saying in the Sentai. Well, granted, don't in the Sentai. Girl. Yes, and I I also wish that they could have in included a woman in there too. Granted, the pink the pink range in Dawn Brother was a little girlish, but that's beside the Yellow point. Ranger. Anyway, no, no, the the the, the pink one was a man, but he acted like a bitch. He was more timid. He was, very, timid, he, he was very, he was more timid. But what I'm saying is, I... So what, timid people are women, women to you? No, he was just a bitch because he lost his girlfriend, but that's beside the point. Actually, he didn't. He, he didn't. He didn't. She came back, which which was crazy to me. But, um, I, 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 had a, I had a feeling that was going to happen. You I did? did. Yeah. I, I, Does I, it make sense? It, it makes sense. Um, that dude's um, punishment for being a Dawn brother, well, bad luck with being a Dawn brother is... He got to be on the run for 24-7. Do you think a woman would want that? Mm -hmm. Especially since she had dreams about a stable marriage. I know yeah. I know a lot of women on North Avenue that would be loving to have a guy like that. And guess this what? is not <laughs> America. This is Japan. We but, no, 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 no. But still, there is a girl like that. There, uh, He's not running around with her. Yeah. Well, yeah, but... yeah. Yeah, that was very true. I did. But my, my point is, I would I would love... Is pillow song? No. Oh, more oh, than... Me. More than just one woman to be a part of a team, because especially for, for for on women's side that they're gonna feel like they, you know, they can't talk to anyone else who isn't a girl that that Why is a really, girl. Not nothing against LGBT. I don't care as long as you're a good character. I don't care either. But what, I, what I'm saying is, it's just, so far, yeah. I mean, they're good character. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, so I'm glad good. that they did the approach with the Green Ranger making her a woman. Yeah. I'm glad they did. I'm glad that they you did that. You can't have a whole male. You can't. That's why I'm saying you can't have a whole male power team. That's going. That's going to look sus as fuck. Not really. What kind of? I think a love interest, or well, one of them's cute, but something. Let's keep going before he stumbles anymore. 
but hey, at least there are no other massive, shocking reveals for this season. Apropos of nothing, let's move on to episode 14, Old Foes. A figure in a cloak enters Area 62 and approaches Void Knight's Sporks chamber. Ah, good, Andros is here to finally solve this whole thing. Void Knight and his generals intercept him. <laughs> Behold! You're not Andros. So, just like the Vengex reveal <laughs> last season, this one got spoiled for me too. Initially, not by any fan, though I would have been more on that in a moment. No, in this case, it was a friend accidentally retweeting it, not realizing it'd be a thing for me. But even if they hadn't, YouTube friggin' pushed it out in a recommended video. And before he says, well, maybe don't go onto YouTube to avoid spoilers or something like that, I'm curious where the hell you're watching this then and what you think my job is. And then several people spoiled it in reply sometime after I'd already been spoiled on it and no, I hadn't mentioned it or talked about it anywhere. Asking for what I thought about it. As a reminder, I don't watch Power Rangers while it's airing anymore. I start watching it when I work on the HOPR video, which is usually like a few days before the video comes out. Usually, this video was meant to come out sooner than it did. You should always always assume that I have seen nothing of the show if I haven't made a history video on it. Because I probably haven't. I knew the spoiler about Lord Zed before I knew the names of any of the characters of this season. Nick's yeah. appearance was not spoiled, so it was a genuinely cool, exciting moment for me. Zed's reveal got spoiled, and I spent all these episodes waiting for clues that this moment would happen. Wondering in my head if Void Knight was really him because the design of his helmet kind of vaguely resembles that Zed's grill mouthpiece. Race. It changes my viewing experience when I know something's coming, and I'm trying to approach the show in good faith on its own terms. Now, in the interest of fairness, I'm not the only one who got spoiled. Apparently, this episode aired in France and the UK before it did in the USA, so <laughs> everyone got spoiled that this was going to happen beforehand, so it's not like I'm a special case here. Many probably assumed that I had seen the same spoilers, and since it was out there anyway, there was free game to discuss it. And hey, it's my own fault for not watching the show as it airs. I've gotten spoilers for other shows sometimes just thanks to Twitter trending topics. To be completely free of spoilers, I'd have to just log off from social media entirely and never read comments on my videos and never talk to my friends or loved ones who are in turn curious about my feelings about it. It's just I'd like to encourage better behavior, if only because I feel like we shouldn't have to do all those things in order to not be spoiled on something that happens. And we shouldn't! No, that, that's, that, that's another thing. We shouldn't have to do all that. You don't have... You, you, like, you shouldn't have to shut down everything just to not be spoiled. People should have respect for other people. If they, they know that they like something and you should respect the fact that they want to see it for themselves and find out for themselves and everything. And it's another reason why I bring this up. Guys. People. People. Sakurai clan. Members of the Sakurai clan. I appreciate every single time when y'all let me know about videos that have come out or certain things that have happened regarding a nerd a nerd wise the, these like the, the, the people that 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 you know literally let me know about mm -hmm. Budokai Tenkaichi 4 That's dude kind of dude dude no no not, not it's not even his fault cuz this dude let me know hours before oh wow hours before yeah i didn't even know sent me I sent me the video. link all that shit he said that he's been doing that for a lot of Super Dragon Ball uh, uh, Hero uh, videos. Because I've been doing it for Dragon Ball Sundays. Uh -huh. And while I appreciate that, I will say this out, out of, like, in the most respectful way possible. Please stop spoiling things for me and for a good m number of people who watch this stuff. Because uh. we want to see it for ourselves. And at some point, you can't really help it because if it's, if if it's excitable, I mean, it's excitable. You, you, you yeah, want to share. You want to share it with everybody, and you want to talk to talk talk to about it with somebody that knows. Because I, I well, not to cut you off, because like when Scarlet and Violet stuff was coming out, I was getting the leaks for it, and I tried my very best not to say something to these two because they wanted to right go for themselves. Right. So I kept it under wraps. Try to anyway until that until the final forms came out. I showed Rio. I didn't show Zen, but um, you know, not so cool anymore now, is it? But then, but then again, we live in an era where the internet is free reign. So whatever comes out, people want to see. 
it's going to be on the internet. I mean, even if you want to see it or not, it's going to be there. So he has a point. If you turn social media off, of course, you, you don't see it. On uh, put the shit in the newspaper, which is dumb. But again, they have yeah. done that, though. They have done. But that. Even, but when you when you break it down, I mean, you should not have to nothing. Do that. Nothing. Well, not I can't say nothing's a surprise, but not a lot of things are excitable anymore because 4chan and Reddit are prime areas for leaks. Social media is another one. So then there's that. Which is the reason why uh, Master Zen a while, a while ago he wanted to be free of the spoilers because he wanted that excitement to come back, and I did too. Oh, it's been so long since we were even excited about it, anything. Yep. That like, um, it would be great if we were just completely oblivious of the shit, and it just came to us uh, naturally. We just I mean, found it, out. It, it would feel a lot. It would for me. It, it would feel, feel a lot, lot better. better. Yeah. It would, I would feel a lot good. I would feel good. But even even because I, I I tend to look at leaks a little bit sometimes myself for stuff that I wanna. Let me do. see if we're recording. But I'm sure we are. Probably. Okay. Okay. But we um. Yeah. I mean, shoot. I'd be mad if we weren't recording this I know. entire time. I know. That'd be hilarious. Yeah, but I but um. The video. Goodbye. You <laughs> were just. I'm what? going to sleep. Are no, you going good? But anyway. Curious yeah, about my thoughts on it. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm the loud, opinionated guy who has made hour-long synopses of a children's show who spent several minutes in them rambling about baby carriage chases and the poor cinematography and editing choices of explosions. Trust me, you'll get my opinions about it eventually if you're patient. I think that's enough diversion. Let's talk about some plot here. The villains recognize him and are naturally confused as all hell. I'm not sold on his new voice, done by Andrew Lang, a.k.a. Vengex and Evox. He puts on a standard deep gravelly villain voice for him. When honestly, his Evox voice was closer to Robert Axelrod's Zed. Zed did not have that deep a voice. It was more conniving. A bit more snake-like. Not it cutesy deep, high pitch, but obviously, like but needing more of the throat to get the proper intonation. Anyway, despite that, he makes a good first impression here. I've commented before that Zed was never one to physically engage in combat, but you really see how powerful he is by deadlifting Void Knight with one hand Damn. and kicking Slyther away effortlessly. However, Zed is ordered to stand down by this guy with frickin' skeletons hanging from him like a necklace. This is Regul. Regal's a sorcerer and necromancer, and elected to resurrect Zed at his most brutal. In turn, he put a compliance collar on him to make him obey. Not entirely sure how that works when, as far as I know, Zed isn't dead, just living as a normal human, but hey, maybe that guy got killed at some point in the last 20 years. Regal wants the Sporex to power up his resurrected forces, even bringing back two Sporex beasts as a demonstration. But Void Knight makes a counteroffer destroy the rangers, and he'll give them a Sporex. This is consequently a Halloween episode, as the rangers are setting up for a Halloween dance with spoopy decorations. Ollie says he isn't frightened by anything, because he can logic his way out of horror situations. So the rangers make a bet with him that they can scare him. As such, while he goes on a haunted trail they've set up, they all get taken prisoner by Zed and Regul. Ollie destroys the two resurrected Sporex beasts, but they just reform. With Master Regal's regeneration energy still flowing through us, we can't be defeated! Regal has access to Time Lord regeneration energy? Oh, and then he just destroys them again and it sticks. Ollie tries to take on Zed on his own, but Solon teleports him into the Command Henge before that can go as badly as you might think. They consult the database Mick gave them for some archive clips to find a way to fight Zed including a random new audio clip for Alpha. Voice is uncredited, but clearly they just chipmunked someone's voice for it. Aye, aye, aye. Zed has transformed our rangers into children. Not perfect, <laughs> but still closer to Richard Horvitz's Alpha than the one from Once a Ranger, at least. He had a horrifying and ginormous sword of his own, Serpentira. You, yep. you have the clips, yep. and Solon is voice acted. How do you get the pronunciation wrong like this? I mean... As annoyed as I was when that happened in Megaforce, it kind of was just emblematic of that series' incompetence. This one has been going just fine. Like with the clips in Beast Morphers, they did some more revoicing. Zordon in particular, which doesn't seem to have any effects added to it. It just sounds wrong. Hurry! You must destroy my energy too. Right! Time is running out. Oh Hurry! Oh god, the is just messed up this one. Why?! It was dubbed by a woman in this clip. <laughs> Why?! The clip was already there. You could have used it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. Stop, stop, stop. Stop it. Why, why are we woman, dubbing? No, nothing wrong with a woman dubbing this episode. It's just, 
there's no reason for them to dub it since they have all the clips. Could you stuff. have the clips? You own it. You literally own the rights to these clips. Mm. Even we can't even use these clips. Wow. So why are you dubbing it? Because it's not in the budget. And that's probably true. It's probably cost a whole lot of money just to. <laughs> it costs a whole lot of money to pull an old clip. Then you have to re re um. Revise it and all Remastered that shit. And, yeah. Pitch that shit up to 4K problem. But it is so much more easier and less cost effective to get new voices and dub over Do you know the clips. Are getting paid by no, the not, not, hang on, hang on. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, the 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 voice. Well, not the voice actor. No, the voice actor from uh, Zordon and the actor that played as Andros. Yes, they're still alive. Yes, they can still get royalties off that. But besides the fact, so hang on. Dude, you but, just answer your own question. But, 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 but watch this. Watch this. But they get royalties regardless, I though. Know. But, but remember, executives are stupid. And, but that's that's not stopping anything not stopping from it. it. That isn't stop. They what, what's wrong? Stupid. Oh. They still. No, we good. We just, oh. They still stupid. Cutting off someone's pay is not stopping. Remember, it's, it's cheaper it's, to pay someone who has little to no experience versus paying someone with all experience in the world who might usurp someone that they might be looking. To, it's a whole chain of business. It's it's ridiculous, is what it is. It's life. That too. Let's keep going. <laughs> Let's keep going. Time is running out. Anyway, Ollie points out that they don't really have a giant head in a tube to sacrifice the to stop hell? Zed this time, so they need to think of something else. Realizing that Zed was taking oh, orders from Regal uh, and they didn't have a collar in the archive clips, Ollie remembers see You don't remember them? You don't remember them. Go back real quick. Go no, back. because they that's that that makes no sense. How do you not remember that old episode? From right there. Right there. Hold on. You don't remember them? Zed made evil rangers. Zed made evil... They didn't last... They, uh, they, they didn't last the uh, they, uh, entire season, but they were only for an episode. No, they episode not even two? an episode. They, they lasted for at least a minute. They were on screen for... No, not even a minute. They were on screen for like 10 seconds. Don't hate me. I do not remember. Ten to thirty of seconds. You don't remember because you don't remember a lot of things. Just keep going. It's, it's been a while. They didn't get to that. fight. They didn't even get to fight. Yeah, I don't. I'm fight to stop Zed this time, so they need to think of something else. Realizing that Zed was taking orders from Regal and they didn't have a collar in the archive clips, Ali remembers seeing the collar from the database playing a clip from the Beast Morphers episode with Rygog using it. Ollie destroys the collar, allowing Zed to have control again. After all this time, I'm free. I'm free! Zed forces Regal to retreat, and the five rangers, reunited, take on Zed alongside the yet again resurrected Sporex beasts. While Zed survives the attack, he knows that he's not quite as powerful without his staff, and elects to retreat for now. If I return, I'll crush you like the cockroaches you are, and burn this planet to a cinder! Void Knight takes Regal, sedates him, and locks him up in a cell, thinking that his powers might be useful in the future. So, the return of Zed. I've got to admit, I'm a little off-put by this inclusion, especially after what had just happened with Beast Morphers. Sure, seeing him again is great, but I'm a little worried that coming off the heels of a series that had a lot of references to past Ranger stuff, wherein the main villain was actually another past villain, that every series is now just going to nostalgia bait the older audience. Team-ups and references should be used sparingly. It makes them less special if they happen all the time or in every season. Sure, I always want the current team to meet the previous one, but that's mostly for the hope that we catch up on the previous team's story, see how things have developed for them since their ending. I'm interested in these people as characters, not just for the prospect of past ranger stuff appearing. To me, constantly throwing in references to past seasons, bringing back past villains whose stories are long since resolved, especially as big a one as Lord Zed is, and with the meta wince inducing part that he lacks Robert Axelrod's amazing voice, reeks of, we have no faith in our current product, love us because the old stuff is here. Remember, one of Megaforce's big flaws is that they threw in fan service without actually understanding why these things mattered. A Zordon mention, saying a place is Corinth when it looks nothing like Corinth. Random Corone was Astronomer mention when it has nothing to do with anything. Having references is good. Having team-ups and past characters return is good. 
but doing so much so quickly over two shows, eh, I just don't want Power Rangers to spend all its time jerking itself off instead of producing a new, fun, interesting product in its own right. Beast Morphers at least waited until it was almost three quarters done before it started really laying it on. Here, we had Mixed Return in Episode 8, Zed's in Episode 14, before we even get the Sixth Ranger. The episode is fine, but it's not great. While Zed looks good, I don't think they quite got his voice down, and I don't just mean the way the voice sounds. The way Zed speaks, his inflections, and the kind of words and phrases he would use. I don't feel they're quite represented well in Old Foes. In addition, the lack of the Lord Zed theme is noticeable. Sure, as has been pointed out before, they may not really have the rights to the music anymore, but not even an attempt at a sound-alike? The deep horn section with a few single oh, notes that might sound similar? Minute. Wait a minute, what? They did, they did get... Who did it? Um, shit. I don't know if it was Hasbro or somebody they did buy out the rights, I think. I'm not mistaken. I just don't. I don't remember who. That um, I, I can look that up later. You telling me someone bought out the rights to the damn music? It seems uh, like it. They can't even use the music. Probably not. No. Then that's the case. How the fuck do they keep using Mighty Morphin? The Power Rangers. How? Right? Yeah. How right. Right. That? Right. How do they keep rehashing? How do they keep? How do they keep rehashing the same damn uh, uh chorus then? Well, because the chorus is different than the song lyrics. Yeah, well, yeah. If, if you if you sample it, then yeah, yeah. That that's how. Yeah, but I don't know. This is just getting messier it's, it's a weird and messier chain of events, and I messier, mean, yo. If it's still under Saban or whatever, I mean, they should still. I I don't know. My 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 brain is too small. And I'm too tired for all this thinking right now. <laughs> to his theme but not quite it no it's the same music and sound the season has already used sure the cloak reveal is great and the cinematography is doing a lot to capture how big a moment this is but it's doing all the heavy lifting the new suit looks cool but without the voice his mannerisms or the light motif it just doesn't quite have the feeling that this is lord zed anyway we continue the story in storm surge Javi is assigned by Jane to do a story at Buzz Balloon on a strange storm that's been hovering over Pine Ridge Bay for the last week. It's causing bizarre electrical interference that's preventing boats and planes from entering the area. So Ollie's mom is sending in a specially equipped submarine drone to try to investigate further. Zato recalls how the Nexus Prism had gone into the bay before, so it could be connected. The drone locates a glowing object under the water, but thanks to some shenanigans by Slyther, the drone is remote hacked by the villains. They bring it to shore, but a dark, shadowy figure emerges from the object before they can take it. The figure soon makes his presence known to our heroes. A gold ranger. His weapon is like a sword that's also a hedge trimmer. If you want to be generous, you could call it part electric saw, which is still neat, just kind of weird. Also a lightning gun, which is also always fun. And he combines it with the sword to call it a blade blaster. Don't know if it's an intentional reference to the Mighty Morphin weapon, since the words are generic enough for that to be a thing but it's still cool regardless. He doesn't demorph, just say hi to Zato, who's clearly disturbed by this ranger's presence before he teleports away. Ollie's mom later tells our heroes, not knowing who they are, how she saw the ranger emerge from the pod, speculating that since rangers are connected to the morphing grid, that somehow within the pod the energy built up and spilled out eventually leading to the electrical storm. In the next episode, Ancient History, the Gold Ranger arrives at the Command Henge and demorphs in front of our heroes, revealing himself to be another Rafconian named Ion. He explains that in the final battle to try to destroy the Sporks Beasts, their Ultra Zord was heavily damaged and they had to eject. Ion's escape pod landed in the water and I guess put him in suspended animation? He says he saw the Green Morphin Master appear and awaken him, warning him that if he didn't come back, Lord Zed would reign again. Wait, but Lord Zed's not on Earth. He's been gone for ages. It was two episodes ago. How much time has passed since then? How do you know he's not on Earth anymore? Ion says he's happy to join the team, but only on one condition. If he can lead. The others object, but Ion explains some more history we weren't privy to. Namely, that the Sporex didn't arrive on Rafcon. They were created by the Rafconians to combat an approaching evil. Ion knew that they had rushed out the creation of the Sporex. What? Zato had an opportunity to object and... Yeah, that happened. What? They made... The, the people made it. They didn't come out of nowhere like, Ooh, aliens from a space. No, that didn't happen. They made that motherfucker and they destroyed him. I'm so glad you're here for all this, because this, this be pissing us off. <laughs> they Kryptonian their own planet. Pretty much. They just Kryptonian their planet. They, they literally just fucked their planet to death. 
with Sporex and shit. And now we got two black people fighting over who, who gets to be leader. Well, the re- there's a reason for that. He had a choice. He could have said that these aren't ready. Let's put them back in the lab. But instead, he said, let's send them out now. Yeah. And his friend, who is the Gold Ranger, suggested we shouldn't be doing this. We should just t- really put these through a test before we send them out and destroy our, our asses. And he didn't listen in. That's how it happened. That's why he wants to be leader. Like, you made bad decision that you made the bad decision that which destroyed our planet. Fuck you. So he wants to be the leader because he fucked up? Yeah. No, Nigga, yeah, you can To write his wrong? I can write stories so much better than this. Uh, I wouldn't say right that... is wrong because if you, well, I... Nigga, if you had a choice like that. And it literally led to... blow my planet? No, you... you no, you... Not blow my planet. We though. literally created an ultimate weapon. That has not been fully That has tested. not even been fully tested. It's a prototype. Then why is it... But hey. you go on the lines of saying, no, let's put this bitch out now. No, that's never a good idea. That's what he did. That's what he did. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's, that's what, what he did. That's what His he did. friend he objected to, to, to it. Uh, Red Ranger. Great. Gold. Gold. Gold, Gold. Gold yeah, objected to yes. it. I thought it was a Red first. Ranger. Gotcha. Okay. Red yeah. Ranger said, let's put it out. Gold Ranger, like, let's wait and, see, and finish this project. So no, he this? like, let's do, the, let's do the beta test first. So so that way we wanted to deal with no problems. He said, fuck it. And, that, and, and it completely fucked his planet. Yeah. So his yeah, son... Yeah, yeah, go do it. Fuck it. Go ahead. Go <laughs> he tried to defend the, go- the Greek. He yeah, I think he was a little bit confused. I, I, I got it mixed up. That's my yeah, uh, He was a little bit confused. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Take, take him off or off. Go ahead and hold that. Boom. I'm you, you me, and I'm you now. Solve the problem. Wrap the plan from going forward. Ion even begging him to do so. But instead, Zato approved the plan. Ion, in turn, tried to destroy the machine that created them, okay, but quick. Zato I'm, stood I'm, I'm, in his way. I really hate those night outfits. Just to, like, put that out there. They look really corny and plastic. And That's I why I said bring back the Mystic Knights. Because cause they're, because they're, because they're, like, the look, their attire was, was actually fire. I understand that, Joe, but <laughs> I was just about to start it up again. Since Brian messed up and didn't start it up again. I was about to. <laughs> Way. And instead, the Sporex were released, and, well, the rest is quite literally history. The Rangers are pissed, though honestly it feels a bit overblown. Sure, maybe Zato could have objected, but he said he trusted his leaders' decision, and there was no way he could have known it would be as bad as it was. After a battle with Mucus goes badly for Zato's leadership, it seems the others are coming around to Ion's point of view. Thanks to the hack of the submarine, the villains nah, have found nah. Ion. That was bullshit. That was bullshit. You should have fell at least three times just now. That was bullshit, and you Nigga, know. Nigga, there are people who were able to stand up for like a few seconds, slipping, still slipping, and then fell. You just saying to save face on that shit. I'm not saying to save face. They're the data was like that and plan to destroy it. And I just pissed off too. Look, you bitch, you won't fall, fall. Bitch, you fall, fall. Take charge. Zeno Shame. allows Ion to take command for a bit, but sadly it leads to the Zords getting wrecked. Oh, Ion gosh. realizes that leadership means making hard choices that everyone else will judge you for, and defers leadership back to Zato. Fortunately, the Mosa Razor Zord activates and saves the Megazord from total What's destruction. Ion hands command back over to Zato, and they resume being friends. And it feels a little too pat of an ending for me. Feels like they could have stretched this into an arc or at least a couple episodes. Especially with how Zato seems so shocked and worried about Ion being back. Maybe some other detail about their past together that would make him worried about Ion taking command. Like if Ion had done the same thing before, but he was reckless and not willing to think about his actions or something along those lines. Still, we've got our sixth ranger now. His costume is essentially the same as the others, only instead of the gray on the left half, it's blue. Kind of continuing a trend among gold rangers for the last several series with blue and gold. It doesn't look bad, but personally I think it'd look better in black. In Across Wires, they combine the Mosa Razor Zord with the Dino Fury Megazord to form the Fusion Ultra Zord. Which honestly does not feel like it should be an Ultra Zord. It's just four Zords together, not even more than one Megazord. Maybe if they had all six Zords together, but that still feels kind of weak given what we've had for Ultra Zords before. Feels more like just an enhanced Megazord. In the episode Waking Nightmares, the Rangers recover two more battle keys that have been hidden away. The Light Dino Key can break magical curses, convenient honestly given how often that happens with monster attacks, and the Shadow Dino Key, which activates a new battle armor and can create black holes. 
Oh good, we're gonna end Dino Fury the same way Dino Charge did with the Earth getting sucked into one. However, the keys can also be combined to form the Cosmic Dino Key, which can create portals to anywhere in the universe. And neat, but Rick Sanchez already figured that out. Hoo-ha! Check it out, a dimension where hats wear people! Hmm. Oh, and of course, the keys are also linked to new Zords. Thanks to said portal travel, though, they find that the Zords were transported to the planet Nibiru in a distant galaxy. As such, our heroes travel to it to retrieve them. That's an alien planet? Yeah, you'd be surprised how much of the universe looks like a rock quarry. Or Canada, if you've got a Stargate. We also learned that what I thought were constellations before in the morphing sequence? It's actually the morphing grid itself, which honestly looks a lot more impressive than a random technological tube, or whatever that was in Once a Ranger. However, Voidnet observes them using the grid to supercharge a key, realizing that he can tap into the morphing grid itself to power the machine that will restore his girlfriend. He releases Regul to restore Boom Tower to life and distracts the Rangers. Can you just resurrect a robot using magic? The two new Zords combine with Ions to form into the Mosa Shadow Megazord, which destroys Boomtown by shooting out a black hole that he sucked into before it destroys itself. I would just like to note for the record that the Rangers now have a weapon that shoots collapsed stars. However, it turns out all that was just a distraction, so Void Knight can steal the equipment that could tap into the morphing grid. The first season comes to a close with Void Trap. The Rangers quickly deduce that Void Knight wants to tap the grid's power and come up with a plan to sabotage the part he still needs for the equipment. Void Knight soon learns he needs one more component and dispatches his generals to retrieve it. I promise you, my darling Centaur. It won't be long. The device was created by Ollie's She's mother, who had been studying the Henge, and they bring her to the command center to explain the plan, though still neglect to mention her son of the ranger. However, when they execute the plan, they kidnap her, too. Now she's lost in the dark dimension. Oh, oh, great, the things were bad enough, now she has to bargain with Dormammu. Zeno uses the cosmic keys to head into the dimension and rescue her. However, while he destroys Regul and rescues Ollie's mom in the green screen dimension, the other rangers, minus Ollie, are captured by Void Knight. Zeno reunites with Ollie as Void Knight activates the machine at Dino Henge. The power begins flowing, but the amount of energy going through the rangers will kill them if it's not stopped. Zeno is captured, and Ollie's mom distracts Void Knight while Ollie destroys the Dino Henge statues and free. What? 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 My question. Oh, <laughs> the mother hidden in, in the bag with a stick. The fuck? How's that funny? She said, this, they said there's distraction. It's so random. You just, you just walked up with a stick. No, imagine you a Power Ranger. <laughs> and this, and this, like and Ranger. this 35 year old he woman is a power takes a big ass stick. Some single man. You think it, you can't, you shouldn't be feeling it because you, cause you got, you got your, you got your Ranger form on. But she clacks the shit out you in the back. And he was like, ah! That, I'm sorry. That's her. That's hilarious. I'm sorry. That wasn't hilarious to me. It's, it's, just... a, it's okay. It, again, a lot of random shit happens and it throws me off guard. So the only thing I can do is laugh. That shit was funny. You just whack. The Rangers will kill them if it's not stopped. Zeta was captured and Ollie's mom distracts Void Knight while Ollie destroys the Dino Henge statues. Well, and I see, though, he didn't cut off like the it, power it, it, hit, it hurt However, destroying the statues right. also cuts off their connection to the morphing grid yeah. and they demorph in front of Ollie's mother. If you dare hurt my son, I will hunt you down and obliterate you and everything you've ever loved! Damn, can we make her a ranger? Still, while they can't morph, they still have their weapons, so they can Do engage it. Void Knight and the henchmen. Izzy slices up the stasis chamber, so Void Knight goes to protect it, allowing the rangers to blast the energy capacitor of the device and make it go all explodey. And I'm sure we'll never see Void Knight again. The group wonders if they're even still rangers, and in a bit of irony for me, Ion says that on Rafcon, once a night, always a night, and thus none of them refuse to give up the fight, especially since there are still Sporex out there. Which, of course, is counter to how in Once a Ranger, the team gave up. I don't know, I found it amusing at least. However, as a bit of a deus ex machina, the Green Morphin Master shows up and restores the statues, telling them that their work isn't over yet. But I have questions. What about Rapcon? What happened to my people? Damn, if only you had a device to let you teleport anywhere in the universe. Anyway, after the Rangers are called away to deal with another sports attack, we cut back to Area 62, where apparently the cryo chamber was teleported back to. Centaur's eyes start to flutter, and we see Void Knight's very scarred helmet on the ground to end out the season. 
But okay, we also have the season requisite holiday clip show with that same Santa actor from the last several series, and also Dang. Slyther and Mucus escape the green screen dimension somewhere in between episodes. It takes a while for the clips to get started, admittedly, but it eventually happens. Slyther and Mucus manage to slip a bomb into the base and, like idiots, gloat about it to Javi and Solon who are stuck in there with it, the villains having also disabled their communications and teleporter. They have to find the bomb, which they suspect was swapped out in the presence, and consequently the gifts relate to flashbacks to earlier in the season. This is also, at the time of this writing, the last new episode of Power Rangers to air on American TV. The second season of Dino Fury switched to airing new content exclusively on Netflix. It's an interesting new development, oh. which, of course, we'll have to wait and see how things but go. It season, could mean shorter seasons, oh, yes, longer single seasons switched. again. Yeah. Much like Hasbro taking over the franchise, things just suddenly went up into the air. No more Nickelodeon mandates on content, either. Let's properly move into Season 2 with the episode Numero Uno. Amelia is filling in for Jane at Buzz Bulma while she's away doing a hot air balloon show. So Amelia was, like, second in command this whole time? And honestly, it feels like she's doing a better job running the place than Jane was, since she's actually doing her job instead of going around doing comedic subplots with Jay Borg. Otherwise, Ollie's mom is working at a research institute in Japan, while Zato and Ion try to locate Rafcon after 65 million years of stellar drift. At Area 62, Slyther and Mucus work on breaking into the secret chamber. Mucus deciding to do her best Miley Cyrus impression. However, they're soon contacted by Void Knight at the base's computer screens, who tells them he needs them to obtain something from the Rangers. A monster attacks the Rangers and manages to steal a key that can be used to repair things. With it, he repairs his armor and resumes his quest to collect Sporex. In Missing Pieces, Solon is able to identify Rafcon's three sons, the coordinates they need to use the portal to it, and Zato heads there to try to find his homeworld. He's unable to locate the planet, but he does find a transmitter beacon that's sending out what seems to be the same signal they had received in the first season. However, Ollie figures out that they're not the same message, but rather separate parts of a single transmission. When played together, the message is heavily garbled, but they do make out the words, To Those Who Survived, and Rafcon. As part of our Zord count, they soon recover the Packy Smash Zords in Tiny Trouble, wherein we learn two bizarre things. One, that Zords can actually reproduce, and that apparently Rafcon had the concept wait, of Wait, wait, huh, what? Hey, their Zords can reproduce. Excuse me? I'm sorry? Their oh. Zords can reproduce. And, well, in American fashion. For some reason, in the Japanese Sentai fashion, the baby is... The baby Zord does exist in, uh... I don't know where it came from, but yeah. Robot eggs? Probably. We'll go robot eggs for 200. America robot penis. How that, far it, have we gotten it, to this point? That's been so brilliant year, it, for a long time. Anyway. Reproducing robot zoid penis. So. I'm saying that word. That would imply. Imply. This entire time. Other than I want to say Lightspeed like, Rescued Zords and like like the, any uh, Zord that has an animal form is sentient. Yes. Do 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 do. I mean, do, do, before they became robots, they had to have their DNA from somewhere. Do do. do yes, but I would I would I would think that that would have been done by you know I guess alchemy and and alchemy. stuff like yeah basically you, you magic can, basically magic basically they ate like blood of this animal machine parts Zord. It was more like information and, and I guess animal. the spirit of, but uh, okay, blood of, <coughs> blood of the What do you think the, blood the alchemy is, nigga? Have you watched, have you watched Full Metal Alchemist? Yes, I've watched Full Metal Alchemist. No, we, no, we, we gon', no, we're not, we're not deep diving, no. <laughs> Sing, since blood they use a bunch of boxing related stuff with the Smash Zords added to the Megazord. More importantly, at the end of the episode, Void Knight finally recovers enough Sporex to power his machine which is able to restore Centara. In the next episode, it's Stitched Up, we learn that Void Knight's I real name is Tarek, as he helps Centara recover. He's apparently been preparing a ship this whole time, and it's almost ready for them to leave Earth, a subject that makes Centara uncomfortable since she didn't realize they were still on Earth at all. While he keeps Centara's existence a secret from his minions, he does tell them he's working on a device that will jam the Zords. At the end, we learn that they were involved in some kind of accident, Centara thinking that he should be seeking revenge against humanity for what happened to them, but Void Knight is only interested in leaving the planet with her. In the next episode, Jam Session, Void Knight explains to her that he's keeping her and his appearance a secret because his minions only respect strength. If they sense any kind of weakness, they'll turn on him. Not sure how accurate that entirely is. The robot under his command should, you know, be programmed to obey him, and Mucus is 
Well, kind of goofy. Oh, yeah. There's also another general that got built near the end of Season 1, Wreckmate, who was seemingly destroyed there, but then came back in Season 2, but hasn't done anything of note. He talks like a pirate. Anyway, the Zord Jammer is deployed, but they end up destroying it thanks to the addition of a new Zord. The Terra Freeze Zord. While everyone else was out, though, Centara redirects the Sporex energy into her stasis chamber, using it to transform herself into a monster. She now calls herself Void Queen. Between episodes, she apparently introduces herself to the other minions and starts utilizing... And this is where I have a problem. She's very creepy looking. No, not that. The... If I remember correctly, that was one of the villains... From, uh... The Train. The Train Sentai. Oh, God, they did it. They fucked... I, I quit. I quit. That, 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 no, I'm saying that's where I have a nope. problem. Nope. We couldn't I get quit. a Train Sentai over here, so they just oh, decided to God. use their I, costumes uh, instead. The, the suit of... The, one of one of the, the they, villains. They actually... Yeah. They took... They did it again. They took... <sighs> they took they something from a Sentai and made it a part of of this ra of, of, a, of a Ranger series. But we like wanted the Sentai. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, this is, this has got to stop happening. But you know, I'm not an executive. Sorry, my joints was starting to ache. Oh, okay. Got you. I, I sports they gathered to awesome. send new monsters out, though Void Knight objects. He doesn't actually want to hurt humans, they were just collateral damage. But she's hell-bent on hurting people. He goes with a Sporex beast to a pool where the monster turns people into trees. When he spots a child that's been transformed, he's horrified by all this. He shows Centaura the spaceship, which is now ready to go. Uh. And she destroys it. Well, to be fair, Void Knight, that thing did look like a pile of junk. Probably would have exploded on the launch pad. She right. blasts him away, and he realizes that he needs to stop her, informing the Rangers of how to stop the monster of the week, and then goes on the run. We continue on in serious business. While Void Queen starts working on a secondary project, Void Knight evades his former minions to try to figure out what to do next. As part of the subplot involving a child hacking Buzzmati, he realizes that he needs to join the Rangers in defending the city. The Rangers are only willing to accept the idea he could change if he recovers the Sporex that he originally stole. In The Hunt, we learn that the secret project Void Queen was working on is... Another General, who is destroyed in the same episode. Huh. 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 Anyway, uh, Void Knight warns the Rangers about the new robot and a bit of his backstory. How Centara was injured in an accident and why he stole the Sporex. Zeta was unwilling to work with him given all the harm he's caused, plus the fact that he was willing to do all this just to save one person's life. Still, he comes around when Void Knight frees the Rangers from being captured by the robot. Void Knight was injured from the battle, and it's revealed that his armor and whatnot comes from the Dino Knight Morpher and Key which he found long ago and adapted for his own use. He surrenders them to Zato, who uses them to activate the Dino Knight armor, basically the battleizer for the season, and it's slick as hell. Now as Tarek, Void Knight tells the Rangers he has so much more to explain. Hello, dear. No! Well, I guess there are still 13 more episodes. We need some time for exposition. Oh, in the next episode, Loser Weepers, she locks him up in her old stasis cryotube, though he's still conscious and alive. I'm just wondering how he poops in there. Anyway, to defeat a powerful monster, they have to form the Primal Ultrazord, the configuration that resulted in the rest of Zato's team dying. Apparently it's unstable, which is why it went kabloom when they used it. Fortunately, with millions of years of hindsight and Ollie's technical know-how, they figure out a way to keep it from blowing itself up like last time. In the next episode, Void Queen begins using the stasis chamber in the same way she used it on herself, having the Sporex energy transform Tarek. I am Void King! Naturally, it's brainwashed him as well, so now he serves her loyally. Anyway, we come to Ultimate Mystery, where Buzz female. Barnaby is doing a story about Area 62, in interviewing Pop female. Pop because he was a janitor there. He denies anything supernatural about it, and Amelia gets sidetracked with news about a Bigfoot sighting. You know, standard filler episode material, nothing to it. We're expecting a call from General Shaw. Wait, the head of Grid Battle Force? Okay, so, um... I apparently thought I had talked about this in the Beast Morphers video, but um, I evidently did not. I did mention speculation about what universe it took place in, but I never really came to a final conclusion about it in the video. Thing is, 
I did ultimately decide that it was not the main Rangers universe, that it was its own thing. I'll get into that more in a bit, but starting from the assumption that Beast Morphers took place in its own universe, I'm not going to question how Dino Fury knows about Grid Battle Force. Obviously, the database Mick had should include meeting Rangers from other universes. It's just weird that we're getting what should be the annual crossover episode, and it starts out with a plot about Bigfoot. There's been a jailbreak at one of our facilities. Many villains have escaped. She warns them that one may be headed their way, and I'm just... What? See, with the presence of Zed and the knowledge of his existence among both heroes and villains alike, that made me think that Dino Fury was supposed to be set in the main universe. But they talk about Grid Battle Force and Coral Harbor as if they were in the same universe as them. When I did my Twitter thread, everyone said it was pretty definitive that Beast Morphers took place in the main universe, but that doesn't make sense to me. The Beast Morphers Earth wouldn't need access to Ranger tech from other universes if they were from the main universe. Jason had to come to them via interdimensional portal. Before you say, well, why couldn't it just have been a regular portal? Well, why would Devin have to risk his life to put out a call via the Morphing Grid to get help from other universes if there were active Ranger teams running around in their own universe? This is an official organization with military backing, and they couldn't call Lightspeed Rescue for help? Or the Wind Ninja Academy? After all, if they're in the main universe and have access to all that Ranger tech given to them, it means they are in contact with these teams. If Beast Morphers is its own universe, then contacting other universes is difficult, as we saw with their attempts to contact the RPM universe. But if they're in the main universe, it would be really easy to get help. Hell, if it's the main universe, why are there no Ranger veterans that work at Grid Battle Force? Wouldn't you want the most qualified, experienced people with knowledge of the morphing grid working on your big project to tap it for power? And that's another thing. Grid Battle Force wasn't just responsible for their own rangers. They were behind Morphex Power in general, a project that had international cooperation and participation unprecedented in the show's history. And I have to imagine that after Evox was destroyed, the other governments would not be so keen as to stop using Morphex like America was for some reason, Yet we will never see it again! Now, you could argue that at the very least, Beast Morphers and Dino Fury take place in their own universe together. Not impossible. But then why is Mick running around a complete other universe hunting the Ninja Nexus Prism? Did it jump universes at some point? I admit, there is nothing explicitly said in Beast Morphers that they were in a separate universe from the main one. But the way everything is framed in that series, the way they talk about past villains, the Rangers failing to recognize the putties with Rijak, the technology of accessing the Morphing Grid, the lack of connection to other past teams, the way the suits look different from all other Ranger teams, just everything about it screams, this takes place in a different universe than everything we've seen before, and these are their first Power Rangers. And furthermore, even if we assume that Dino Fury and Beast Morphers take place in the same universe, how does Sean know how to contact them? They've never met before! Both teams operate with their secret identities! Sure, with the resources of Grid Battle Force, they probably could figure it out, much like how Lightspeed knew who the Wild Force Rangers were, but you'd think we'd have seen some kind of message between them before now! Some exchange of resources and tech! Bring the Dino Fury Rangers under a local division of Grid Battle Force or something! Just, like... Beast Morphers being in the main universe opens up more questions than it answers, and this episode throws all that out a window! Anyway, as if on cue, the escaped monster arrives and attacks. I'm no sport! Okay, after saying all of that, here's, here's, here's the, only, the only conclusion. The only thing, logical thing that I have to everything that he just said. Given the choice, the fact that they've come across all this technology, the Morphex, the Morphin Grid, all of that. Off screen, they found a way to come in contact with each other. And they occasionally say, say, say shit from time to time. Occasionally. But then you gotta take into account, like how you said, communication. If, if it's not, if, if they don't even hint at it, how is it, how is it plausible for all of a sudden you know where uh, Beast Morphers are, if they can help you, or Grid Battle Force exists, and they need assistance because wh whoever, whatever, is attacking now. Like, would you, it makes sense, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we did it off screen. Then, of course, people like us and Lynn Carr are going to well, go, why haven't, but, but, why haven't we seen y'all together? 
Why have why I'm aren't saying, y'all working together? Like, why why if, aren't if y'all? If they wanted to have their own universe, I mean, make note of that in the first few episodes, so we know it's there. And have have occasional help fuse the teams together. Do I'll say the here. same I mean, thing that you said before. The executives are stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They don't want to pay the actors. They want to dub everything. Mm-hmm. That shit that shouldn't be dubbed. They don't want to pay nobody. They don't want to pay nobody. That's, that's, Despite that's, the fact that's no that this that this though, IP man. has been around for so long and it's worth so much money, okay. you don't want to pay the people too much money. Not in the budget. They got to dumb it down so they can save money or push out as much merch as possible, even though it's going to sell itself whether you know you have it in the budget or not. Why not? But again, like we said before, if you, if, you, if you have the Legacy Rangers, if you have all these things that are akin to the uh, Sentai... Then use it. It's, it and, and I'll a say new, this. A new, a new, ba- new theme, opening theme, where the content creators actually I give a shit about the series, yeah, do something with it, yeah. That in itself generates more money than going, oh, we, uh, Zen had this idea, fuck that idea, let's go with my idea because right. it makes sense, right? To me and not the fans, right? The fans that are requesting the stuff to happen, right? It just doesn't make sense. But they would rather spend less money to save them money, even though they're gonna make money regardless. And then in the same plot point, in the same thing, it's Boom Studios, the a comic, the comics is saving the Power Rangers. But more. the comics, they fuse all, they fuse all, they fuse all that together. Anyway. But they're doing it Cause right because they're all a part of the Morphin Grid anyway. Right, but but uh, that's just the thing. That, that's the whole, that's the thing that he's getting at. They're doing. Why is it only a comic? Why is it the comic series doing a much better job than what y'all doing? Because they're not making any real money like the uh, like Saban has, bro. They're making. Quarters compared to their, you good? You're all right? <laughs> yeah, about my bad. <laughs> checking up on you. They're right? making quarters versus the dollars. And it's a whole, whole, whole big, whole breakdown. Yeah, and then you got stuff like this. They include monsters from other Sentais. Like, come on, yo. Granted, as good as Tokyo J is, I don't want them to adapt to Tokyo J. I don't either, but damn. It would help to have you know, if they, if they did Power Rangers right and kept it akin to Sentai, sure. Up that battering I am Luthor, nephew of Lokar, the terrible wizard. I was kidding! I mean, I just fully expect at this point with the obscure Mighty Morphin stuff coming in that we're gonna learn that Jane is actually the daughter of Principal Kaplan or something. Anyway, despite the cameo from Shaw, this isn't really a team-up episode. Apparently, because of the pandemic, we did not get a proper team-up episode for Dino Fury. It's and that's that another thing. Knowing who the Dino Fury Rangers are and all that is the remnants of what would have been a team-up. Something we can imagine happened off-screen. And hey, I suppose we can assume that, like, the monster just jumped dimensions and they were able to detect that. After all, Scrozzle was able to hop to the RPM Earth and all. We can say this isn't really from the same universe. Pearl Harbor's close, but there's no way that brute just randomly decided to attack us. Maybe he means it's close interdimensionally? Ugh. Anyway, Mr. Pointy says that his master instructed him to attack the statues at Dinohenge, that it would cut off the ranger's connection to the grid. After they destroy him, Ollie finally asks Amelia why she cares so much about cryptids and the like. She explains that her parents were supposedly killed in a fire, but all the evidence around it is uncertain, and Pop Pop doesn't like to talk about details. Thus, she's drawn to bizarre mysteries like that hoping that solving ghosts or something would help her figure out what happened to them. Later, though, at a debriefing with General Shaw, she reveals that they were able to recapture all their prisoners, save for one, Scrozzle. Intel says you've already met the mastermind behind him. Not him. Lord said? <laughs> Good dramatic ending hook for the episode, but if Beast Morphers takes place in the main universe, why is she treating the return of Lord Zed, the guy who terrorized and attacked Earth for a few years, as if he's only significant to the Dino Fury Rangers who recently encountered him? Why isn't she putting out an all-points bulletin to every Ranger team on Earth to warn them? Why not send another message through the Morphin Grid, especially to the Mighty Morphin Team, who we know are active because of the team-up episode last season? If they were in their own universe, they might know about Zed, but more in the context of the past and his recent encounter with the Dino Fury oh, Rangers. Oh, no. Not really understanding how big a deal this is, versus the very big threat posed by his return, since remember, 
The Rangers never actually beat him! In the next episode, Zed returns to Area 62. There's been a noticeable change in his voice. It's still not Robert Axelrod quality, but it's higher pitched and there's more of a distortion in it. I was in the neighborhood and thought you might like to meet my new servants. Said new servants are his general Scissorai and, of course, Scrozzle. He thought was nothing compared to you. But, um, don't tell him I said that. Why is he still alive? They don't die. Well, not that. They just didn't kill him. They really just didn't say, shoot him. They just imprisoned his bitch. Well, they should have, because he's the most, he's the most annoying, slipping, sniveling little thing I've ever heard in my granted, life. Granted, they did keep a bunch of other ones locked up in space. Too. Didn't not Lothar? Who did that? I can't remember off the top of my head. Another villain did that. He kept a bunch of old Power Ranger villains. Villains locked up in like a big ass <laughs> spaceship or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. I might be wrong though. They weren't, they were villains, but they weren't Power Ranger villains. Oh, we did, then I'm wrong now, okay. Because that was what, uh... Lothor? Not Lothor, it was... In, it, it was uh, in a big ass shit. It was during Dino... Dino, Dino Charge? Yeah. Oh, that, um... The, uh... Ah, I forget what his name is. The, the damn... Ship? No, not Fire Ship. The, uh, the, 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 the bounty, the, the space bounty, uh, yeah. Yeah. dude. Yeah, him. I said Fire Ship, I didn't fucking read it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> That's why I looked at you like, what the fuck? Yeah, Shit, I know. Yeah, much as I love Zed, Vengeance did have a higher body count, Scrozzle. Zed wants help in destroying the Rangers, agreeing to split the Earth in half between their forces. What? Zed had Scrozzle retrieve his staff from the Crystal Dimension and Beast Morphers. I guess they just left all that stuff there after Vengeance was destroyed. And plans to have him construct an army of robots. Void King likes the idea, suggesting they take the general robots he had made before and creating enhanced versions of them. Using mind control on Ollie, he retrieves the two parts of the Rafcon message. It seems Zed encountered a third part while he was traveling the galaxy after last season. When combined, the message gives Rafcon's coordinates for any survivors, saying they moved it to allow it to heal from all the damage done to it. Zed proceeds to take Boom Blaster, a rebuilt Boom Tower, and heads off to the planet. After healing Ollie from the mind control, he remembers everything and informs the others of all this. This leads us into Rafcon Revealed. With the coordinates, the Rangers open a portal to Rafcon. Ion confident he'll defeat Zed based on what the Morphin Master said to him when he was brought out of stasis. However, once they arrive, they find the planet deserted. It's no longer a wasteland, but there are no life form readings. Zed and his forces are already there. It seems he's searching for the original generator that created the Sporex, hoping to use it to create his new army. We get some good pathos from Zedo as he reminisces about the city that used to stand in the valley they're in, but Ion reminds him of the job they have to do. The generator was plugged into Rafcon's core. If it was damaged or destroyed, the planet would have gone up with it, so it must be functional. Though that does make me tilt my head who thought it was a good idea to plug in the dangerous experimental device to the core of the planet! The rangers head to where the generator should be accessible, but it turns out that's what Zed wanted, leading him right to it. And man, you'd think after 65 million years of plant growth and geological upset, that there'd be more than just a few shrubs on top of the control console. With Zed's minions distracting the rangers, he's able to activate the generator. Ion and Zedo try to attack, but it doesn't go well. Here's an idea for you, Red. Why don't you do what the rest of your people did? And go extinct! Zed blasts at our heroes, but they're suddenly saved by a protective shield and are transported back to Earth. Zedo is severely injured, more so than Solon can help with, but their savior soon arrives, the Green Morphin Master. This leads us into our next episode, Morphin Master. She heals Zedo and explains that they were unable to stop Zed on Rafcon because they lacked the arsenal for the job, revealing to them the Dino Master Saber. It's extremely powerful, and the armor it unlocks protect you. Wasn't it nice to have a deus ex machina in your corner? But anyone who uses this to destroy their enemy will also be destroyed. Well, that's a really terrible design flaw. Take it back and fix it! What the, what the fuck? fuck? What are you people doing all day if that's the best you can do? Well, it seems there might be a reason
reason for the rush job on that. The blue Morphin Master arrives and explains that green here is actually breaking their laws. Shortly after the Great Sporex War 65 million years ago, they began to realize that with each Power Ranger team they created, the amount of evil that grew in response multiplied. The risks of the Morphin Grid became too much, and they took a vow of non-interference so they could focus on protecting the grid. She's broken that and has to be sentenced to imprisonment in a crystal for all eternity. Zeta intervenes, and this turns out to be a stealth clip show, retconning in the Morphin Masters into playing a larger part not only in this season, but the entire franchise. It was the Green Morphin Master who sent the Tyrannosaurus coin to Devon and Beast Morphers, who saved Steel and turned him into a human. Also, further confirmation of Beast Morphers and Dino Fury being in the same universe, as Izzy points out that Steel is the star of her favorite show, Kung Fugitive, but I can write that off as they're just being the same person in both universes. Much like how there's a Jungle Karma pizza both in the main universe and the RPM universe. Yes, I know it's a stretch, but damn it, everything that happened in Beast Morphers really seemed to point to it being its own universe and saying it was the main universe to steal wrong, dang it! But anyway, yeah, Green has actually been responsible for a lot of nonsensical stuff that happened before. The legendary battle and the other rangers showing up and disappearing in balls of light? That was her! It's not said out loud, but the implication seems to be that she brought Robo Knight back too. Now bear in mind, this doesn't suddenly make the season and all that good. It wasn't the intention of the creators at the time, and doesn't suddenly make Megaforce a good series because one stupid No, but you know what? You know what? That clears shit up. That clears shit up. I guess, but... That does. Still dumb. That clears shit up. It does. It does. Of everything that that's happened with Power Rangers, and I mean everything, all the grievances that I had with Mega Force, semi gone, semi. Maybe not semi. Maybe like a quarter. A quarter. Like one eighth. You still hate it. Yes. Thank goodness. But it does explain shit a little bit. Just a tad bit. A little bit. Now. Bitty bitty bitty. That being said. <laughs> If y'all are responsible for every single calamity that, that has fault? happened so, as with every Ranger team you have made, that would imply that you made the Morphers for Lightspeed Rescue. Yeah. You made the Morphers for Time Force. You've made the Morphers for SPD. Emergency. The entire time, I'm thinking they created their own Morphers. No. Well, what about, for those people, it, what if they actually, the Morphing Masters didn't create the team. They created the teams, but they did it in a way for, for those teams, like, they gave information to the people. You mean they gave them hints and little uh, like pieces of information on how to make the Morphers? Yeah, because yes. I, yeah, I think that's what I can see they, that happening they, because they literally, they, that, yeah. they literally said that they were full, they wanted, they wanted to stay out of the way. Yeah. But they, they didn't stop them from dropping little, literally, yeah. little things yeah. for people so people could find it. Like for for some of the shows, people literally made their Zords. Yeah, they literally took their time making their Zords, like Lightspeed. So they so they were inspired by, they probably used the powers from the from whatever the Morphin Masters dropped off, mm -hmm. and then or whatever information they did, whatever they information they had, hard drive or basically or somebody yeah. or. They send it like a dream to a person. And they're like, "Rika, I can make a sword." <laughs> like that's no, 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 but no, no but that no, does that. Does, that, that, that no, could but explain some of the scientists is worth uh, reason. That, that that is true. Yeah, I not like to mention, idea, but no, but the Morphin kind of, Masters are 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 uh, are powerful enough to omnipotent beings. They can make somebody think about something. All right, make us Power Rangers. Nigga, shut your fat ass up. <laughs> that's exactly. But <laughs> also, it. so that also that also. Drives okay. read about Ninja Storm, about Di especially Dino Thunder, all of that. Yeah, well, that they've sense. been literally dropping hints. Shit, shit for Ninja Storm, um, for the Wind School, they probably just they yeah. they could have at least they could have talked them how to use Ninja Storm. They could have. <laughs> they could have. But the only Wind Ninja is the um the what with the Hamster Sun. The Hamster Sun. The Green Samurai. Yeah. 
Morph Sunrise. Oh. Yeah, he may have made the Morphies, but he actually tapped into the grid, though. You, yeah. have, yeah, you have to tap into the grid in order for this shit to work. You can't just make a Morpher and then automatically think it's going to work. Now, now, I, I, now, now I got to go watch a bunch of videos about not only the Mighty Mor- the mighty Morphin Morphers, yeah. the Mighty Morphin Morphers. And the, the, for fuck's sake, the, like if we go all the way back to the um, the Morphin Ninjatic, Masters um, and the Morphin this, Grid. Um, Blue nigga, ninja dude. Uh, ninja. Ninja. He could have been made by the Morphin Masters. Because he, he made the power coins. See, this 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 He could have. This is gonna be a two AM YouTube. Well better yet, Fuck like that. uh about uh, after Zordon died. I, I I honestly before Zordon died, he must have had a heavy hint because relationship when... with the Morphin Masters because he knew about the Morphin Masters. Yeah. So it goes Morphin Masters, Morphin Grid, Ninja. Because they, they, uh, Nick, he uh, no. could have gave him Morphin Masters could have gave uh Zordon the fucking Zeal crystals. Yeah. yeah. So Morphin Masters. So Zordon. They, they created everything. Morphin Masters, Got Zordon, it. Ninjor, and Ninja everything Morphin else Man. falls under. Okay. Deep dive. Like a chain re- a reaction. Deep dive. Chain reaction. Deep dive YouTube here I come at 2 in the morning. Got reconned, but it's a nice nod and acknowledgement of mistakes made and an attempt to backfill them. Sometimes a band aid is appreciated, even if it doesn't fix a lot. And I will always appreciate a show where the people making it are trying to put forth their best effort rather than ones that clearly don't give a crap. Mind you, apparently some of the fandom has disliked this because it implies that the series has always had a great big green safety net watching over them. A day yes, six machina just waiting around to remove all the tension. I don't know if I necessarily agree. It's clear she didn't do everything, and there likely were moments when she couldn't get involved without getting noticed by the other masters. But still, maybe she saved Kendricks. Maybe she's why the space-time continuum has stopped punching itself in the stomach over in the Dino Charge universe. And we'll have to see in the future if this ever gets addressed, or if there will be other ass pulls that we can ascribe to the Green Morphin Master. Speaking of, the Rangers say they'll defend her from Blue, but she says they need to deal with Zed, teleporting them back to Rafcon. She then flees from Blue before he can imprison her. Unfortunately, they're too late to stop Zed. He teleports away with the generator. And as said, without the generator plugged into the planet, geological instability quickly makes the planet go boom. It was safe for 65 million years. But one day with Zed, it's all rubble. Zato nearly died, he got reminded that his family and friends are all dead, his people are missing, and now his planet blew up. Oh no, today's been a bit of a bummer, hasn't it, sir? Zed brings the generator to Earth. The Void family shows up, pissed at a seeming betrayal by Zed. You know what? I actually might watch Cosmic Fury. Just to, because I bet you they're going to drop a hint about that, or at least try to work around it to fix that hole. Not the hole, but like, they might try to, um bring his history into cosmic theory which is why i think they're going to space for they might stuff. just do that i know they might just do that to, yeah, to, to I, find I, his I, I to might, find I his might, people i might actually watch cosmic to theory. find his people and if the morbid mass have any more influence on they could probably could re- uh, restore the planet probably jesus christ if you could re- no listen if you could re- fucking reverse what the fuck down charge did well if you could reverse that then you can damn sure re- uh, recreate a planet hey, right, right. yeah i'll make a new one but he covers it up by claiming that Scrozzle built the generator to make more Sporex. And that's not quite shut up and slink away. Our heroes show up to stop him, of course. Ion uses the saber and activates Dino Master Mode, giving a spiffy oh, wow. cape and collar. Yeah, I dig it. Awesome. They force everyone but Zed to retreat as he sets up a force field around the generator. Ion is ready to sacrifice himself to break through the shield, but the Green Morphin Master returns and destroys it for him. She and Zed have a beam struggle, allowing for Ion to jump in and slice Zed. With him distracted, <laughs> she blows the generator to hell. However, she can't destroy Zed directly, instead locking herself and him inside a crystal. It's Zed. And what? Mr. Green? Yeah, oh no, she turned them into collectibles! The red and blue Morphin Masters show up and they explain what happened, realizing just how boned both the Rangers and Earth would have been without her intervention. They like to set things right by freeing her from the crystal. They also take Zed to secure him on a faraway planet. Green explains that Ion's prophecy of stopping Zed was fulfilled by his action, but that he didn't have to do it alone. In turn, Zato asks about their people, and she says their fate will be discovered by them in time. And I'm sure we'll never see Zed again. Of course, we're going to see him again. In the next episode, Wishful Thinking, Amelia makes a wish via a monster spell to see her parents again. But despite everyone else who was cursed by it getting their wishes, hers doesn't happen. 
Or does it? In Things Unspoken, Void Queen begins planning her endgame, stealing the keys to a drilling device that the park wardens have been using to build a new drainage system. Once they gain control of it in the episode Bad Vibes, they program it to drill into the command henge. Once there, Void King blasts Solon and steals the Sporex they have in stasis, leading into the three-part finale, beginning with The Invasion. So it turns out International Electromatics was actually being used by the Cybermen as a front for their force to occupy the London sewers. Fortunately, the Second Doctor has teamed up with the newly formed United Nations Intelligence and I mixed up my notes again. Doctor Who and Power Rangers need to stop having the same episode titles. The Rangers help Solon up. Our shields were no match for that drill. Then your shields really suck, Solon, if a human-made drill can penetrate them. However, things take a sudden turn when an alien ship arrives over Dino Henge, containing Rathconians. Zato confirms with his tactile telepathy that they're the real deal. Their leader, Aurea, explains that the remaining survivors of Rafcon hid the planet and left to become scavengers while the planet healed. Hoping to return to Rafcon when the time is right. Yeah, uh, it's a real shame that uh, nobody knows where it is. <laughs> Well, if I say we forget about Rafcon and not assume it's a big pile of debris now. They ignored Zato's messages because it seemed so unlikely that a 65 million year old knight could still be alive. However, after Rafcon's destruction, they decided to follow up on the messages and see for themselves. Aurea privately suggests that they could bring the Rafconians to Earth. Problem is, she's not convinced that humanity would welcome them. But with all the wars and pollution and traffic accidents, as such, they intend to invade and conquer Earth. Naturally, Zato and Ion refuse and say that colonizing and conquest aren't honorable, but the decision has already been made. Meanwhile, with all the Sporex finally in their possession, Void Queen releases them all out into Pine Ridge. That was her master plan. I mean, it's not the worst, it just seems like she could have just released the dozen or so they had all at once and had the same effect. Still, with the risk of the Sporex ravaging Earth the same way they did Rafcon, Aurea agrees to a truce with the Rangers. We'll battle side by side. But after we defeat the Sporex, I guess we'll see. While the city begins evacuating the she entire population, the Rangers and Rafconians begin engaging the Sporex army. However, some of them get called away by Void Queen. Oh, why does Wreckmate get cannons? I want cannons! Bitches love cannons! We soon learn that she plans to destroy the hydroelectric dam that powers the city and flood the town to kill all the humans. Which feels like it didn't really require the Sporex army to accomplish. During the fight, Aurea sees several examples of selflessness and humanity, including Pop Pop actually stepping in to defend her from a Sporex. When he gets blasted away, Amelia reveals herself to him. With his injuries, she takes him back to Solon. The man just saved me. You still want to take us home? She's more amenable to the idea of living in peace with them, even having her forces help the evacuation. At the command henge, Pop Pop's injuries are severe and he suspects he may not survive, so he tells Amelia the truth about her parents. Back when he worked at Area 62, there was a couple of aliens who were there, trapped after an accident. The couple had a baby, and Boy. that baby was Amelia. This leads us into the next part, the truth. She's As an she alien. demands to know more, she touches his arm and sees visions of the accident. The alien couple giving the baby to him to take her to safety and making him promise to keep her safe. When she emerges from the vision, she's a antennae grow no. over her head. No. As the other rangers no. meet up with her, Pop Pop explains that if there's any more information about her parents, they'd be in the files at the ruins of Area 62. Assuming the files survived at all. However, we've still got that whole Sporex invasion thing going on. As such, the rangers return to the fight while Void Queen heads over to Buzz Begonias to interrupt their evacuation livestream and then use some of the destroyed Sporex globs to form a cocoon around herself. Some destroyed Sporex are summoned to the cocoon. Mucus reveals to the rangers that Void Queen is inside of it, but when she accidentally touches it, she gets absorbed as well. The oh, sheer wow. power of it is more than the rangers can handle, so they call Ollie's mom up to try to figure out what's up. She theorizes that the cocoon, whenever it hatches, is going to release a massive energy blast that will destroy everything in a 30 mile radius. The people Jesus. will be safe thanks to the evacuation, and the command center's shields should protect them. Dubious, as I said, given the whole drill thing. But the city's going to be wiped out. They have about an hour before it goes critical, and the royal smart people get to work trying to figure out a way to either move it or siphon the energy away. What's more, Area 62 would also be destroyed. Since this may be her only chance to get answers, Amelia heads there on her own, while the others resume the fight against the Sporex. Pop Pop even lets her see where a safe is with the files. Said safe apparently being stored on some random cart near the janitors. God, Area 62 was really mismanaged. She's intercepted by Slyther, who damages her morpher so she can't escape. 
in the process revealing that Area 62 is their base. Fortunately, Solon detects her morpher's damage and informs the others, who come to the rescue. They give her a new morpher and search the base, both for the files and anything that can stop the cocoon. Amelia finds the safe, but the files are gone. They're attacked by Void King, but Amelia tackles him and reads his mind by accident, revealing that Tarek and Santara are her parents. Rathconians who crashed under the bitch. looking for supplies to oh, scavenge. Geez. The government, being the government, imprisoned the two, but whatever the accident was, it kept them from escaping. The two survived the explosion, Centara injured, but believed that the baby didn't survive the blast. Centara blaming humanity for this, asked Tarek put her in stasis to keep her alive. He then constructed the power system for it and discovered the oh. dynamite morpher and key, thus becoming Void Knight. Uh. And he decided to hide his antennae for some reason. Go figure. The telepathy goes both ways, so Void King discovers who Amelia is. Somehow this releases him of his hatred, and he's freed from the brainwashing, reverting back to Tarek. However, the happy reunion is interrupted by Solon, who informs them that the cocoon will blow any minute now, but the evacuation is being slowed by Gridlock. This leads us into our finale, the Nemesis. Bringing Tarek back to the Command Henge, they work on the theory that if the revelation about Amelia cured him, it might allow Void Queen to let go of her hatred too, since she's basically running on a hope for revenge over the supposed death of her child. With the remaining sporks destroyed, the Rafconians are told to evacuate as well, and our heroes go to the cocoon. Amelia can't get close enough to it to link minds with her, and they can't wait for her to emerge without everything going boom, so they go for the next best plan. Zato in the Dino Knight armor hopefully protecting him as he gets in close enough to teleport the cocoon away. However, Tarek volunteers instead. You and your team are still needed for what will be the biggest battle of your lives. Let me do this for you. He succeeds, the cocoon safely exploding in a more deserted area. Tarek survived, but the Dino Knight Morpher is destroyed. Nearby is what Void Queen describes as the Nemesis Beast. Good she didn't God. actually transform in the cocoon, instead of just creating the giant creature before them. The amalgamation of all the Sporex that she operates like an organic Zord. The Rangers summon all their Zords, but they she's still nice. too powerful for that. The Zords get taken down, so the Rangers teleport into the sky above her and drop down, hoping to get Amelia hey, close like enough to her. Of this is actually a really actually, cool ending fight. The Rangers fighting that. henchmen... That's what happened in this entire... This also, now battle. we include an Ultraman monster. We, we got Chimeras in this bitch now? For a for, for Sentai? No, that mo the monster and all that shit... I I think they changed it a bit, but I, I, I can't remember if it was a while ago. They might have changed it. They might have changed it. But the fight, that's how the fight started. I mean, they are, they do use Sentai footage in Power Rangers, so it makes sense. Yeah, that's how the fight That's how the fight was. Shit. I'm not mad. I, I, I'm going to have to watch Ultraman some more. Good. On the Nemesis itself, before eventually getting knocked off. Real Shadow of the Colossus stuff right here. Amelia gets close, but is knocked away without getting close enough. With no other options, Zato elects to use the mutually assured destruction setting on the Dino Master Saber, defeating the Nemesis Beast. Void Queen survives, but Amelia finally manages to grab her arm and reveal the truth to her. She lets go of her hatred. You're my mom! <sighs> oh, that's nice. Still kind of a bummer that Zato's dead. But what did <laughs> you know it? The king of Deus Ex Machina shows up. With the Sporks' power drained, they're able to store them safely and away from the rest of the universe. The Rangers beg the Morphin Masters to bring Zato back, but they simply say that he's part of the grid now, a piece of him forever being with them all. Mucus also survives, somehow, crawling away yeah, from the battle. We cut to six months later, where the Rangers are helping the Rathconians set up their new colony in Area 62. Centaur's pregnant with a sister for Amelia, and apparently the actress was actually pregnant in real life during this bit. Oh, so I'm about to say. <laughs> I am to set up a restaurant serving genuine Rathconian cooking. And I guess people know he's a ranger now, or at least he revealed his alien nature as he serves Jane and Jayborg, who say they're going to be opening a new office for Buzz Ballyhoo and Angel Grove. A poster shows that Mucus and Slyther took on human forms and are now operating a circus. Solon summons the rangers back to Dino Henge as something is pushing past their defenses. Amelia thinks it's a ghost. Sorry, but I'm no ghost. I mean... You kind of are, dead man. He explains <laughs> that the Morphin Masters reconstituted his form to rejoin them, and that he has a mission for them. Lord Zed has escaped. D Duh! I took a really cute photo at home one time. I'm going to work. Shit, I thought you were off today. No, four o'clock. Luckily, it's not a... Dino Fury is a very interesting season, if a bit uneven. 
I think the fan base may have overhyped it a bit. Not that it isn't a great series, it's one of the best, especially season two, but season one is where it kind of struggled. Season one is actually fairly pedestrian as far as Ranger seasons go. We get plenty of good character focus episodes, and one of the biggest strengths of the season is that indeed the character focus episodes pay off big time, but as a result, it often feels like there isn't a lot of forward momentum with the plot. The reveal of Void Knight's motivation is the biggest piece of plot development we get in 20 episodes. Even Zed's return feels a little stilted and unimpressive given what should be a massive turning point. One of the biggest bads in the series' is history coming back, yet you wouldn't necessarily get that impression watching that episode. Season 2, however, is where things really hit the ground. Centaurus' development into Void Queen, Void Knight's betrayal, the Zed arc, the finale, just a bunch of really strong storylines that culminate in a very well-paced, well-performed, exciting finale. You need season one because it sets the stage for everything that comes in season two, but it can feel like season one is a bit of a drag to get us to the good bits. Zed's return arc in season two is pretty phenomenal. Like I said, it felt like in the year between old foes and love-hate, they worked out the bugs on him, improved his voice, he was more cunning, and his plan was pretty damn good and successful, even blowing up a planet in the process. He was exactly the threat he was supposed to be, managing to outfight or outwit the Rangers, who yeah. needed an outside force to help save the day. Hell, hey, he even does some mind control, doing that old corruption of the good guys thing that he did so often in season two. The Zed arc wasn't originally part of the series, but something they decided to add in when the season was changed from 22 episodes to 44. The Hasbro brand office suggesting bringing back Zed in particular, probably to promote a toy or two. And for something that was added in later, it definitely ended up working pretty well. The Void family's arc is also pretty spectacular. Void Knight starting out as a simple, I want power for the sake of power, discovering his true motives are more noble, only to twist things on their head by revealing that the woman he loves is actually worse than him and cares more for her revenge than the man she loves. And finally, them only getting defeated when they learn that the reason for their revenge doesn't actually apply. The tragedy of their backstory is also very well hidden and unexpectedly ties into Amelia's. Area 62 and Amelia's lost parents are just elements that simmer in the background, but there aren't massive hints spelled out for the audience that would connect them right away. And when it all comes together, it does make sense and connects back to the plot about the Rafconians becoming space nomads. I like how the plot of the villains is mirrored in the other Rafconians, who only stop their evil plans when they see compassion and goodness. It's great narrative cohesion in the themes of your work. I know I've gone off on rants and ramblings about what universes everything takes place in, but it is fun to think about how a colony of Rafconians could also help contribute to the Earth of SPD, where humanity is a part of the galactic community. And oh crap, we're two years away from that future at the time of this writing. We better start changing our fashion sense to match. Or maybe they'll retcon it as the dating system of the future being revised to match the rest of the universe, so 2025 to them is actually closer to 2137 or something. Or they'll just ignore it entirely, because why be beholden to the continuity of a series that aired 20 years ago and the target audience didn't watch it? Isn't that right, nostalgic villain from 30 years ago? I kid, I kid. Even if SPD isn't acknowledged by then, it just means I have something to joke about in whatever series we get in 2025. Say, so, hey, you hear about that 30th anniversary special that's coming soon? A lot of interesting behind-the-scenes photos. A lot of interesting behind-the-scenes photos. What hurt the show plot-wise were the more grounded comedy subplots revolving around Jane and Jayborg. We have this big plot about Lord Zed going to Rathcon and threatening to blow it up if he amasses the power to create new sports beasts. I know! Let's switch back to an office nerf war at Buzz Bolaris! I actually would have been fine with this subplot if it wasn't in the Lord Zed episodes, because hey, Nerf Wars are fun. I've been in a few. Jane and Jayborg, despite being the ones who run and manage this apparently huge social media site, are frequently reporters and presenters themselves on basic clickbaity videos that would make Hallmark's craptastic YouTube channel sigh in embarrassment. It also sometimes feels like Jane's character is at odds with what they establish about her. The first episode? The supernatural does not exist. Stop asking for stories about it. A few episodes later, she goes to see a carnival psychic and instantly believes in it. The job of running the place is incredibly difficult and stressful, to the point that she needs a robot assistant, and then she does the jobs of other people or sends a set assistant to do those jobs. Sometimes the subplots won't actually get resolution. We have the setup for it, maybe a follow-up later, and then it's completely forgotten about. 
In the aforementioned psychic encounter, she is literally put on a bus and then never addressed again. Apparently this comes down to how the show is filmed. Fight scenes are handled by second unit filming and dialogue stuff done by main unit. It's consequently why the show has had less civilian fights. As Simon Bennett put it in a tweet, if the cast is filming civilian fights, there's nothing for the main unit to film other than the comedy duo stuff. But the comedy duo stuff is just not necessary. So That's what I'm saying. Here's the thing about that. Instead of making it comedy and trying to be like a, a Balkan scholish, come up with something else. There are tons of other things you, that you can put into without having to be comedy. We don't have to laugh all the time. Yeah. Nostalgia. We don't have to laugh all the time. We really don't. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it feels more like fetish fuel. And as I discussed in past seasons, comedy subplots with Power Rangers tend to work better when it's assholes getting their comeuppances, not otherwise well-meaning people getting confused or screwed over through no fault of their own. I don't know, maybe I'd personally enjoy them more if the comedy was more based on wit and wordplay rather than slapstick, because while Jane and Jay work aren't bad at what they do, Slapstick really requires a lot more work on timing setup and the physicality to make it as funny as it can be, and they're just not really that up to it, in my opinion. Now, Jane's actress, Cora Josephson, does actually possess physicality as she's a professional tap dancer and choreographer, which they actually did incorporate into an episode once, and okay. she posted some behind-the-scenes videos on her Instagram. But it just feels like it's not as good as it should be. Oh, and amusingly, apparently Olivia Tennant, who played Dr. K in RPM, also is a professional choreographer and planned out both the tap sequence and that weird-ass dance sequence last season from Beast Morphers. Kudos if true. Another aspect of the show that was unfortunately a bit weak was the acting for our heroes. It never gets as bad as, say, Troy and Megaforce, but Russell Curry as Zato started as not convincing and ended as only mostly convincing. There's just a chipperness to his voice that he had difficulty making sound natural. He was good in sad, emotional moments, but in casual conversation, he sounded awkward. That might be the idea, but with him being an alien separate from humanity, but it just came across as stilted. Jordan fights Ion also just had this kind of weird, whispery tone to his voice that I personally found annoying. I was going to say Hunter Dino and Chance Perez as Amelia and Javi respectively were also a bit flat, but honestly, they were pretty good too. When the writers gave them a chance to have some variety in the emotions they needed to convey. Whenever Amelia's heart sank, you could see it in her face. Let me tell you something though. Kai Moya as Ollie was good, but Tessa Rao as Izzy was phenomenal. She's the second youngest of the cast after Jordan Fight, though obviously played the youngest, the only character who was still in high school. But she was very clearly the most talented actress among the group, always sounding natural, making every line convincing, and portraying a wide range of emotions. Just an honest-to-God great find for the show. Our other secondary cast included, of course, Ollie's mom, who did good with her material, but the more recurring character was Ranger Garcia. Garcia was apparently originally written to be a sheriff, but the Black Lives Matter movement was at its most prominence at the time of writing and filming, causing them to realize, maybe we shouldn't have a cop as a supporting character right now. Unfortunately, the end result is that the law enforcement hierarchy of this town is confusing, because we do see actual cops, and they apparently report to the park warden. Don't screw with the DNR in this town, people. Oh, they what? hold all the cards. He also possesses an art, starting off as a standard has, aggressive has, parental has figure. the power to control the fucking police? What the fuck? Wait, huh? Huh? Nostalgia. That's not nostalgia. No, that's, that's not nostalgia. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that out loud. It's literally Yogi it's Bear forward. Park Ranger having control over the entire police force. He's the fucking complete... Police commissioner now. He's the king of fucking commissioner. Why, 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 not, why not just make him commissioner? You don't have to make him a cop to make him commissioner. That would have made him. I, I, I would have been fine with that. He is a commissioner. He's a Wait. park ranger commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> You're both for living vicariously through his daughter's accomplishments and being judgmental of his son's seeming aimlessness in life post-high school. He does become fully supportive of Javi once it's clear that him becoming more versed in multiple instruments is not something he's doing for funsies, but because it legitimately builds his skills as a musician. That being said, Garcia was still a major asshole when he took his son's keytar, which he spent his own money on, not his dad's, 
and says he'll return it because Javi just buys instruments to try. That being said, he does not completely shed himself of the living vicariously thing as he takes photos of himself with his son's trophy at the end of the copycast. Ion's story boils down to ego. He's overconfident, sure of himself, and expresses a lot of selfishness in his actions and activities. Not only is his re-emergence into the present day about being told by a godlike figure that he's essentially a chosen one, the guy who will stop Lord Zed, but thanks to him being the one who objected to the Sporks plan while Zedo embraced it, that he is a better leader. Time and again we see him wanting the spotlight and prestige of being the leader or benefits of his actions, but needs to be taken down a peg and reminded that you do the right thing because it's the right thing. By the time we get to him actually taking on Zed, he needed to learn that just because his actions are critical to stopping the Emperor of Evil doesn't mean he's doing it alone. He's also kind of obsessed with food as a comic relief quirk. Zato, of course, ties in with Ion's story because of their shared history. Unfortunately, Zato's arc is probably the weakest of the show, since his character beats are focused primarily on plot-related circumstances rather than on emotional ones. He's pleasant and tries his best to embrace Earth culture, but his story overall is his quest to find Rafcon and his people again. However, his eagerness to reunite with his people only has one focus, where it's about character development, phoning home, when he takes someone's word that they're from Rafcon, and it turns out to be Slyther in disguise. His over-eagerness to reunite with his own kind almost cost them everything. And hey, when the Rafconian refugee shows up, he's learned from his mistake, and uses his telepathy to confirm their identities first. Still, at least we get recurring moments of angst from him about not knowing where his people at home are. Admittedly, it feels more like something that just bums him out on occasion, as opposed to any really strong, sad moments, but it's at least something that they come back to more than once. Honestly, I feel like we should have also had more time to focus on Zato and Ion having survivor's guilt. It's kind of brought up in Waking Nightmare, where they have to fight phantoms of their past teammates, but there's nothing that angsty about the situation, and it isn't dwelled on. Javi's arc ties into his father most. He's a musician, liking to try out multiple instruments, and yet can't seem to settle on a single one. That annoys his father most, that he comes across as directionless and not doing anything with his life. Still, that relationship comes to a head in Jam Session, where Garcia expects his son to show up and support him when he's receiving a medal, but instead he ends up getting recruited to perform in a band. Garcia is pissed about him not showing up to support him, but Javi turns it around and points out that his father refuses to support him in his activities. Still, once the warden sees what he was doing, he realizes that his son was right and supports him in his music career. And hey, it's what he wanted out of Javi. He wasn't against him playing music, he just wanted to settle on something and go with it. But that gets turned around as well. In The Copycat, a disgraced singer plagiarizes one of Javi's songs for a contest at Buzz Belladonna, and he strikes back by performing his song, utilizing multiple instruments, elevating his performance and showing off his skills in them. Amelia's main arc is about her parents, but it's not really something dwelled upon. While she, of course, has beliefs in superstition and the supernatural, it's not until later that we learn that her belief in such things stemmed from having lost said parents under mysterious circumstances. It's her way of trying to rationalize and seek out answers from what could have been a random freak accident. Admittedly, as we discover later, her parentage is something to do with aliens and the like, but that part is not hinted at at all until the end of the series. And while normally I might be annoyed by that, I'm not. Too often in Power Rangers, they make those kind of twists very obvious, and most kids can put two and two together. But they held off and let it be a genuine surprise and fit with all the established facts they had been setting up. The villains' his backstory, Area 62, Pop Pop's connection with the site and how he didn't want to talk about what happened to her parents. It's all handled very well. Her secondary subplot ties in with Ali and the growing romance between them throughout the show. What started out as arguments between them about their very different viewpoints grew into genuine affection and consequently why Ali's later remarks that dismissed her beliefs or seemed to not care about her views at all were so hurtful to her. But let's get into Ali. Like Ion, he's overconfident, but this comes from a general arrogance about his own intelligence and belief in rationality and science above all else. He's tech-oriented and indeed smart. When he was younger, he attended a science academy, and we get some very well-crafted storytelling in the episode New Leaf that expands on that. Ali spent a lot of his time at the science academy working with his teacher. He assumed at the time that he was just so smart that the professor wanted to be best buds with him until the professor makes it very clear what was actually happening. His arrogance put off all the other students and nobody else wanted to work with him. You think you have all the answers, so you never listen. No one likes to know it all. 
Because when you're an asshole, it doesn't matter how right you are, nobody wants to give you the satisfaction. This revelation is a serious turning point for him, both in his attitude and his relationship with Amelia. No longer so quick to dismiss her views, even apologizing to her for the way he treated her. And is even willing to help with the scientific investigation of a ghost sighting in the episode, The Hunt. After all, Amelia is not against science, she just believes that there are things out there that science has yet to explain. As a side note, we also have the episode Cut Off, where the rangers are taking a camping trip and he's bringing along a bunch of gadgets and tech. I was so thankful that the episode did not have a message about, like, Oh, you need to disconnect from technology and go back to nature. It's annoying and frustrating, especially as someone who hates camping. In fact, all the gadgets and tech he brought along helped save the day. Sure, some of the devices are a little silly, but they do work. Though in the case of the auto-rocking hammock, that's Zato's fault for setting it too high. Izzy's primary arc is a romantic one, but she has a ton of episodes focusing in on her as a character. A somewhat strained relationship with her mother because Izzy is tomboyish and doesn't enjoy girly things while her mother is a fashion designer who insisted on having her model for her when she was younger. Her relationship with her father and cousin relating to her athleticism, Warden Garcia pushing her to be the best, and consequently her pushing herself to the point of being frustrated with her cousin when she thinks she's blowing off her training. And that while she is great at the athletic parts of school, she doesn't do so well in other stuff, like learning about electronics for one of her high school classes. We also get a great message episode for the younger audience about predatory businesses. In this case, a gym that Izzy wants to get into, run by a famous athlete, who it turns out is running a scam, doing very little work, nickel and diming the attendees for stuff like expensive uniforms and equipment, and lying to them about their own skills and progress for her own benefit. It's wow. good modern messages to get kids prepared for beyond pollution bad. It's kind of ironic that Izzy, the only character who's still in high school throughout the season, gets some of the most mature storyline stuff when it comes to her romance with Fern. They yeah. start out as athletic rivals, love the shot of them glaring at each other on the track field, very Luigi and Mario. Mario Kart vibes, but soon start dating. In the run-up to the end of the season, we have the episode Things Unspoken, where we learn that Fern has to move away to college for an athletics program Izzy wanted to get into. It's revealed that Izzy already got in, but she decided to turn it down for the sake of her ranger duties. After Fern says the big I love you to Izzy, she then learns that Izzy turned down the program, which would have kept them together. In the end, Izzy tells her the truth about being a ranger, and of course, they plan to do a long-distance relationship. God damn, people. I melted into a puddle from that moment. Oh, and by the way, Izzy and Fern, first on-screen kiss between a couple in 25 goddamn years! Not really anything I can say about Solon. She kind of serves as a quasi-mentor role a couple of times, in particular advising Amelia on how to get over her belief in bad luck in Superstition Strikes, but otherwise, she was more the alpha of the season, with the team not really having an official mentor. Dino Fury is a great season. A bit overblown by the fan base, in my opinion, but definitely worth a watch, especially in Season 2. This was a good team, with good villains, interesting character dynamics, and a lot of enjoyable lore drops. But for the first time in a very long time, we're not done with this team. We'll see how our heroes continue their journey, the 30th anniversary of Power Rangers, and what Zed has in store for them next time in Power Rangers Cosmic Fury. Can't wait. God damn, this is long as hell. That was an hour, nigga. Uh, we made it longer by, by talking. Hey, we need help! I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. This nigga can't count. Oh my One, god. Two. Buckle my shoe. Get, 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 get. Three, four. Uh -huh. Is you out the door? Five, six, you better lay them sticks. Oh, no, since he's out of the fucking picture. Let's just do this. Yeah. Um, so, there you have it. Yes, you do. This is two hours. Jesus Christ. Yes, Y'all better watch all of this. No, I it was an hour, and the only reason it was an hour. Y'all better watch no, all this. I swear for, I swear on everything. All right? Everything. With that being said, I think we've said all, all that needs to be said. Honestly, I think this is a good series. Yes. Despite its little tiny hiccups, I think I think it's a great series. Yes. You guys were right. God, uh, uh, Dino Fury is honestly a good show. Yes. Just you know, bad time with a lot of stuff. Yeah, bad time because of COVID. Yeah. If it weren't for COVID, this would have hit a lot harder. Yeah, it, it most definitely would have. 
But with that being said, this has been Master Rio Sakurai. Master Zen and Urban, Urban Ninja, Ninja in the back doing work. work. Sorry I can't make the last cut, guys. Hope you love me. If not, it's okay. Love Master Zen more. <laughs> We're getting up out of here. All right. Peace.